sneak in into the yes. locker room and he's like telling me how he's having a, like a terrible day or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what are you talking hey. about? Hey. Saw your video. <laughs> <laughs> so homeworks. Down with three? Yes. Down with three? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. And I had to think about where I was and what I was doing in life. But yeah, three is done. <laughs> okay. Demo? Yeah. Four? Uh, not demo. But then? Uh, working a couple of There was a bunch of questions, I think, even from you about convergence. Yeah. Yeah, I... I um, there is many ways to do convergence in terms of the actual objective. I think your goal is to get page rank values, say, that are, are stabilizing, you know, and then compare to the, I think, least posted a bunch of page rank values. So as long as your values are uh, right. identical to what they do. Not even them. identical. We need to check that you have a reasonable convergence. No, not the score, but the actual ranking. No, the scores have to be reasonably close. They don't sure, but not identical. Not identical, correct. Yes. yes. As long as you get reasonable close page rank values on the two-inch data set, that seems that you are convergence. On the which data? The one that you gave us? WT, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think your page rank is valid. Uh, keep in mind that page rank is a hack, more or less. It's not, it's not a theoretical sound, you know. I mean, that's the Markov chain theory that we did, but those values, including the teleportation, the D15, right? You change a little bit that teleportation and change a little bit the index and onyx, you might get slightly different page ranks, that's okay. So as long as you have a procedure that iterates and produces with some convergence criteria, a reasonable page rank values, we call that good, okay? Homework 4 shouldn't take too long. And there's no back and forth about homework 4. Homework 3 is a lot of back and forth. Homework 5 will be back and forth to the evaluation and the fact that you have to use your human eyes to look at stuff and annotate them, right? That's going to take time, but homework 4 should be fast. I thought you said everything else is supposed to be fast after homework 3. Yeah. And what do you like? N- not five. I mean, five, it depends on how fast do you click through those documents and uh, check, you know, whether they seem reasonably relevant or not. Uh, we're not going to grade whether your 0, 1, 2 values are correct. So he might think some document is a 1, and the TA might think that document is a 2 because it's more relevant, right? That's okay. That, that's not going to be graded. If you have a consistent approach to what 0, 1, 2 that is defensible. Like if you click at random on things and say, sorry, I, I thought I could do, you know, that's not okay. But if you have a scale that says zero means junk, one means on topic, and two means it actually provides useful information, for example. And you go through, I don't know, 600 documents and you click, 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 click on them, that's fine. It will serve you very well. I don't know how much time people spend on clicking through 600 things, it depends on really how used are you with the experience of um, grading. How many people have been TAs before? Okay. If you've been a TA and you graded stuff that requires a lot of blah, 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 that would help. Because reading documents for the grading purposes, 0, 1, 2, it's essentially looking in that document, which could be a page or two pages or half a page, for a specific thing, right? People who have no experience with grading or analysis, there's pay analysts, I think I mentioned this before, government has a lot of them, that look through a lot of data searching for information before computer existed, like CIA existed about, I don't know, 40, 50 years before computer were invented, and to CIA accumulate a lot of information, NSA, CIA, all the, all, all the intelligence services. They have to have people looking through all kinds of pictures and documents and medical records, so on and so forth, to find out information. Those people are extremely competent at doing exactly that. Go into documents, pictures, whatever else, and find the information they were looking for. Right? So this is very different than novel reading. When you read a book, You don't look for specific things. You try to follow the story of the book in the way it's written, right? You follow the author. You're not not looking for specific information. In here, those documents, your job is not to read the whole document necessarily, 
and, and, and try to understand what the author is saying. Your job is to grade it for a specific purpose. Is this document about, I don't know, Battle of Midway or not? It doesn't matter if it's, if it's interesting or not, if it's good or not. I mean, you can spend the time to read it if you want, but as grading, it's slightly different. So if you have experience with grading, uh, that helps a lot. Other students, what they've tried and succeeded in highlighting, if your interface, the one that displays the document so you can annotate it, could highlight the query terms, you are at some query, right, Battle of Midway. If that interface highlights the word Midway, that will help because it will immediately, if a document, if, another thing uh, highlighting is a document may be longer than your display, you need to have some scrolling function in there. Scrolling is typically provided by your framework. But if you could scroll by default to the highlight, if you see the word midway, I'm using a made up query here, battle of midway. If you see it, if that was your query, and you know you have three places where midway is highlighted, if you could scroll by default to the first occurrence of midway, that's effectively the snippet functionality, right? I'm providing a snippet with what I think is relevant for this query. That will help out the evaluation. If not, it may be a little tedious, plus you get fatigued. People who are not used to annotations and judging, after 20 minutes may feel like, oh, another document that has another three pages, you know, how do I look through it? So you gotta, you know, find a way to do this without reading the whole thing, okay? The queries are the ones that, I, I mentioned this in Dropbox, the queries are the ones that have sub numbers. So something like, 15203, there's a query. And I think that's already in your Dropbox, but if you don't have them, you can let me know. And we can come up with more queries. Uh, you can come up with, uh, I, I, I want every team to do three queries, but I want all the members in the team to judge 200 documents for each query. So once the team decided we're gonna do the following three queries, so me and him and him are in the same team. We decide we have three queries. We pull top 200 documents from our index on those three queries. That's 600 because it's 200 times three queries. And we all go through all 600 documents. So at the very end, we're producing for each document for one of those three queries, three judgments. My judgment, his judgment, and his judgment. Make sense? You said they did put it on top five? Yeah, the ones that are before the URLs, you may not have all of them. You may have just yours. You have to get to your teammates to get the other one. So there's the initial one that's 1502 might be the grand topic, World War II. That's not a query. But then there is a subtopic there or subquery that's different for each student. I don't mind if you want to pick three queries by yourself. If you, if you say, okay, we want to ask specific queries that are pertinent to my index, you can use Talk to me first, but that, that's okay. I'm, I'm not really interested in which queries you pick as long as they are on that topic that you have, World War II in this case. Uh, but keep in mind that every document out of the 600, which is 200 per query, have to be judged by every member of the team. So every document will end up with three grades, one per team member. So you would first collect those 200 documents per query, you make a list of here's the documents that we need to judge, 600 of them. If you have, if you have four members, it will be 800 documents. Or we can do 150 just to sum up to 600 total. And then every one of you will go through this, uh, presumably with an interface that displays those documents and allows you to put your you know, name and then click, 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 uh, zero, one or two and collect that data in a text file or CSV file or some, something that you can have, okay? So I think that's a harder part of Homer 5 because the rest of it, implementing track, your own track eval, that's, that's not hard at all. So we'll, we'll go again over the precision and recall and average precision formulas. It's quite easy with two for loops to go through this QL file. In fact, the track eval that I give in Homer 1, it's a very easy to read program. It's a Perl script that if you open, you can see how it reads the QRL file, it reads the results file, it sorts the results file by the score. That's an important detail that we have to go over it today. And then it computes average precision and many other things. So you'd have to implement your track eval. Uh, it's easy to 
maybe compare with that tricky value. If you if you take your your documents, the 600 documents with the annotations, and you put everything in a tricky value format, in the curl format and in a results file format obtained from Elasticsearch queries, you could run that tricky value from homework one just to see what average precision it gives you. So that way you can compare with your tricky value to see if you get the same exact result. But remember, for that tricky value, you need a certain format. Or you can modify that Perl script to read your own format, because that's very easy to do. OK? Um, is there any questions, other questions about homeworks three and four? I can take the time, even the whole lecture, to do questions, because I'm way more advanced than you guys are. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing evaluation today, and you didn't even start. Anybody looked at homework five yet? No. One. Oh, that's good. I'm not that advanced. So, so any questions about three or four? Are we going too fast? Are we going too fast? That's a university requirement to go that fast. I agree with you. We are going too fast. Um, there is a very uh, interesting guy at CCIS. Now he's a dean of something, Professor J. Aslan. And a long time ago, many, many years ago, he wrote an email to the rest of the CCIS why double speed courses cannot be really working at double speed. And one of his arguments, it's a long email, was a debate at that point in time when the, the system has been designed. And one of his arguments is what happens when a student gets sick? Can you get healthier twice as fast? You know, like, like everything has to happen twice as fast. But what if you get into a fight with your girlfriend? Can you can you tell your girlfriend, hey, we need to solve this in two days. We can't take four days to solve this because my schedule is now double speed. You know what I'm saying? So I think it was quite funny. I, I thought to mention it in class. This guy is one of these deep philosophers who, when he he takes a long time to think about things, but when he says something, it's much more profound than the rest of the room. You know, so I know him for 20 years. You know. So, yeah, people debated and he came up with these arguments. I mean, everybody agreed, yeah, that's not going to work. But we still do it double speed. <laughs> so um, that's not my decision, really. So let's be realistic about this. How many homeworks should we do? So you are at four now, let's say. Four. Presumably four will be done quick, say in two days. And then what? How many days we have left? Today is August 1st, and then we have, what, at the end of the week, say, say, assuming you guys finish by Friday, homework four, which I think is very possible if you put your mind at it. Uh, that will be August 3rd, and the last day, maybe August 24, let's say, so we have three weeks. Five will take some time, because you have to go through documents. Maybe you implement highlighting annotations. You you can collaborate on the on that, that that tool that displays and collects the annotation. It's one per team, and I wouldn't be upset if you if you adapt an existing tool for this purpose. So don't, don't, you don't have to each one of you to create that tool. Once you have something that works, you can all, all three people can use it. But you still have to collect all the judgments, put them together, run tricky val. That's not going to be an overnight thing. Trick uh, this page rank, especially if you have a computer that runs like a 20 core server at home. Running all these hits and salts on page rank can be done in a matter of hours. The home of five cannot because it involves your human effort. But after that, it's easy. If you have a minimum experience with machine learning and data mining tool, running off the shelf tools on, on the on this data, it's not that hard. So how many homeworks should we do? Can we do three more after four? That is, five will be next week. And then six and seven. Right. So I think that's what it's going to come down to. We have to give up on eight. That's no way around it. And six and seven, we'll combine them into one. They may drop one exercise or one, one thing in there to make it doable. Uh, I think it's still doable if, if you dedicate somehow next week to homework five and get it done. I, I think it's quite doable to do the rest. All right. But we may have to skip some topics. Uh, I find that there are some 
he, some, some ideas that that works not worth discussing if you guys don't do a homework. You know, like LDA, LDA, I knew about it for 10 years, but I, I, I never understood how it works until I tried to program. So let's first recap uh, the precision we call an average precision here. Uh, that's the core of your track evolve, although I think you have to implement MACG too, so we'll talk on that one. So we have a set of retrieved relevant and the set of retrieved and um, we said as a, yes uh, is LDA that thing from like David by out of Princeton. Right. And it, it's implemented in the Latin Dirichlet analysis. There's such allocations. Allocations, allocations. sorry. That's yeah. the guy. Yeah. It, the reason it's important for us, we, the statistics of it and the machine learning part of it, it's not easy. Yeah. I think it uses Gibbs sampling, which it's not the obvious sampling. You might say, hey, I've done uniform sampling, I've done sampling with repetition. How hard can it be, this Gibbs sampling? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not that easy, but you guys have a taste of it last term, I think? Yeah. Right. Um, but it's important for us because it creates this topic modeling. You can think of topics as hidden concepts in data. So how can I represent my data collection instead of doing words or biograms as uh, some topics that are intermediate for me? And then those topics relate to the basic representation of text, like unigrams. And then whatever I want to do can be done in terms of those concepts or topics, say representation, machine learning, clustering, so on and so forth. So the effect of LDA is critical for information retrieval, but not necessarily the technique. Um, so would a possible extension of LDA be like ConceptNet? Um, I don't know if you've heard that. It's the idea where they were like, oh, let's teach computers common sense. There were many ideas for how to implement these concepts, like hey, IBM Watson, started that way. Uh, ConceptNet, I, I think, I'm not sure, I think it's something like that. Not an extension, I think it's based on that. Um, but there are many others that try to do this. To my knowledge, this is more successful in a specific domain than in a general domain. So like if I deal with diabetes, much more easier to extract concepts from the diabetes literature or papers or stuff related to diabetes than to go to the whole English text of Wikipedia, say, and some other books, and extract all possible concepts. A lot of people try to do this topic related, so if I'm a newspaper like, like Guardian and CNN, then I can, again, more, more focus, I can be more focused on the topics that matter to me, right? I, I would know that anything that has to do with violence and, and terrorism and that is like a, a thing, and everything that has to do with politics and politicians, it's a thing. Hard to do in a general domain. So it's like an offshoot of that, maybe the semantic web with like that sparkle queries on like wicked DDP and that kind of thing. Yeah, does it work? I don't know. I don't know. Can we skip homework but I would do six, seven, and eight instead? Yeah. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> no. Sorry, five is core IR. Evaluation and assessments. Is part the six, six, uh, six, seven, eight are applications that you could easily see them in an NLP course, a data mining course, or other things. They could be in between several things. But one, two, three, four, five are core IR that you probably don't see in a different course. I don't think there's any other course that asks you to read documents, evaluate them, and then implement a metric on that to get a score. You know? Maybe crawling or, or, or page rank. It's been used in other courses, maybe, but I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you can just call libraries to do precision recall, accuracy, or zero. Yeah, yeah, but but it's the same like you can call a builder to build your house, so you can put the first bricks yourself. You know, you got. I have to make sure you know how to lay the first bricks. Yeah, but the difference is the builder is doing the work. I'm still doing the work, you know, and calling the libraries. 
Oh, we'll do, if we do LDA, we'll do that. We'll call a library. In fact, for machine learning, I'm sure you'll call a library. This is not a machine learning course. You can just do linear regression, deep linear, whatever. In fact, I'm going to show you some things that you can call that you're probably not aware of that are much better for information retrieval than standard SVM light or deep linear. Something that takes the data from Elasticsearch and puts it in a machine learning format and you can control that process as opposed to the Sky kit, you can give text and create a feature matrix for you, but you have no options of how that works. I'll show you a library that with your data and elastic search transforms it into a feature matrix, but you control the process. So it's much more fancy. We, we develop it because we needed it to run machine learning on text data. So that's okay for libraries, but this you have to implement. So we're not skipping five, is what you're saying? No. Even if we die with it in August 24th, in our arms. We gotta do five. I tried. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, so. so here we are. Uh, first of all, that's sets. But how do we get this from a list? I can get this from a list by saying, here's my list. List or rank. How do I know which ones are relevant? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say here, this is relevant. How do I know? I need judgments. I need a human to tell me what's relevant. So you're gonna see this as yes, no, yes, yes, no, or maybe one, zero, one, one, zero, or maybe R, N, R, R, N, or any sort of true black. In your case, it would be zero, one, two, maybe the truth or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 if you're Amazon or Netflix. The relevance part has to be obtained from human feedback. Now there are some automatic mechanisms to do this, like from clicks data, if I don't want to collect them specifically, or through these uh, captures, right? Captures can, can, can produce a lot of this data from humans, and humans are not even aware they are actually labeling stuff in capture. How do I obtain, so that's the relevant part, how do I obtain the retrieve part? Retrieved. The retrieve part for us, it's a cutoff. So how do I measure what's retrieved? That's retrieved. In here, that's not retrieved. Uh, let me make it uh, more clear. This part, if we, if we do cutoff, not So by picking this cutoff, I'm deciding the retrieves that are top 10, or top 20, or top 30, and the other ones are not retrieved. That's how I can get those sets. The relevant, again, is based on human annotations or feedback. The retrieved one is I get the list and cut it somewhere. And I can cut it on different places to get different retrieve sets. But the relevant set will change. It's typically the ones that we say it's in the curl. That's how Trekival knows what's relevant. It looks to the curl and it knows it has all the answers. The 600 documents files that you're going to produce, it's effectively a curl file with all the relevant documents in those sets. Of course, there'll be relevant documents beyond those ones that you look at, but that's life. You can't look at more than a certain number of documents. And then we say, these are two positives, right? The ones that are correct and I retrieved. These ones here are retrieved as positive, but they're not really positive because they're not in the relevant set. Sometimes we call this the truth set or ground truth. In machine learning, often you hear the name ground truth. That's what's given as labels. So which ones are those? The ones predicted or retrieved, but not really retrieved, relevant, or correct. False properties. So these ones are false negatives, and these are true negatives that's neither retrieved nor relevant. Okay. Uh, so I uh, I show you some measure based on this stuff. We we say precision. Uh, we so let's say this k is the cutoff used. So this is retrieved at k. 
if I, if I produce the retrieve set by cutting at rank k, then this is that retrieve set. If I cut at a different k, I'll have a different retrieve set. What happens if I increase the retrieve set? What's going to happen with the false positives? So instead of cutting at rank 10, I cut at rank 20. Would I get more false positives? So I decided I have a retrieve set. I want to retrieve more documents. What I'm going to increase? False positives and true positives. What I'm going to decrease? False negatives and true negatives. So if the retrieve set this is fixed, the, the, the Ground truth is fixed. I cannot change this unless I say collect more annotations. I cannot change it. If this is increasing, as in a superset of it, I'm going to increase the true positives and I'm going to increase the false positives, right? Because I'm increasing this set. If, and then I'm going to decrease the false negatives and decrease the true negatives. If this I decide to decrease this set, I'm saying, OK, instead of cutting it at rank 10, cutting it, cut the list at rank 3. I'm going to decrease the true positives and decrease the false positives and increase the false negatives and increase the true negatives. So I show you this plot, which is very typical for data, this ROC curves, that deals with the false positive rate versus true positive rate, that describes as the, the purpose of that plot is to say, at what rate do you get true positives? That's the gain, because that's what you want, by expense being the false positive. So if you look at the ROC curve, this is a false positive rate, true positive rate. You want to go high quickly, because high quickly means I'm increasing the true positives, but I'm not getting too many false positives, right? So this is very good. This is bad. Because this one say, when you increase the retrieve set, you're getting mostly false positives before you get the good ones. Okay. So for us, precision at k, it's at k because the retrieve set being produced by cutting the list at k. So you see precision at 3, that's cutting the list at 3. Precision at 10 is cutting the list at 10. We say it's what? The true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. So this precision is out of the ones that I retrieved, what rate of success did I have? So I retrieved this set, this is the correct ones. And the recall at k, that's the true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So this is out of the relevant set, how many of them I produced. We discussed last time that these are competing to each other. It's easy to get one high and the other one low. If I want high precision, I just truncate the list very high. I'm likely to get one good document. And that's, as precision goes, that's very good because it's one out of one, but it's very low recall. If I want to have increased recall, that's trivial, retrieve everything. I get all the relevant set, but my precision will be very low because now my rate of success in the retrieve set is very low. We also discussed F1. That is precision um, times recall divided by precision plus recall. Uh, this is a harmonic mean. Of precision and recall. It's designed to be sensitive to small values. So in order to get a good F1, you have to have good, uh, both of them being good. That doesn't happen for, say, an arithmetic mean, because an arithmetic mean you can get a decent value by just having y very high. 
And here it's not possible. If one of them is low, the whole thing is low. It's not as bad as the minimum. You can have a stronger version of this, which is the minimum. Out of the two, pick the minimum one. And then that obviously, it's not an average. It's, it just picks the, the, the one that's low. And then we say uh, average precision is the average of precision at k, but not for all ranks, only for some ranks. This is for k that has relevant, this is a rank relevant block. So in other words, this one is saying average the precision at different cutoffs here, but not all of them, only for the ones that have relevant documents. So I look at the precision at relevant ranks and average those. That's the same as saying uh, divide by the number of relevant documents, because if I go by the relevant docs, I'm going to divide it how many as arithmetic average. So I'm going to go for all the relevant ranks, and for each of them, I'm going to have a sum of the precision at that rank, where k is the rank of relevant. So I'm summing the precisions at this rank, this rank, this rank, this rank. I'm skipping the non-relevant ones, and I'm dividing by how many relevant documents are there. Be careful, I said this last time, common mistake here. Who is this R? R has to be not what you see. If you retrieve three documents, you might see one or two relevant documents. R has to be the true relevant number, which is in a curial file. The curial file might tell you how many things are relevant. Even the curial file is wrong in the sense that nobody looked at all the documents. People have looked at 1,000 documents, 2,000 documents, those track people have looked at many documents, but even then they didn't look at everything. So it's possible that some documents were not judged. We're assuming that everything that's not judged by retrieved is non relevant. So if, if it's something in my set that has not been judged, I'm going to assume it's zero. But that's obviously not correct all the time. So that's what we've done last time. Um, I think we, we also mentioned something like R precision, mostly for historical uh, reasoning, so I'm going to skip that for now. Um, how about this one? I don't think we mentioned this one, R, R. That's called reciprocal rank. And it's 1 over R, or 1 over K, where K is the rank of first relevant document. So I'm having a list of results. I'm looking in that list until I see a relevant document. And I look one over that. First of all, this is not a good measure for informative or factual queries. What happens if I type nuclear bomb or algorithm or Northeastern University, which are, which are entity or factual based queries? Any reasonable search engine would produce at the top rank what? A relevant document. So that number would be 1 by 1. When is this interesting? When is this RR, reciprocal rank, useful or interesting? So again, for informational type queries like nuclear bomb or Northeastern University or, or some person name, I'm going to get, there's a lot of results on the web that are relevant. If there's at least, say, a thousand results, thousand web pages that are relevant, very likely one of them will be the top one. And then most of the things will be one divided by one. But when is this an actual interesting measure? 
when the results for my query contain not a thousand good results, but exactly one. So if you ever put that kind of query that has only one good result, what query would be the kind of query that has one good result? A lot of the queries you have in homework one and homework two, right? They're not this kind. They're factual based. You expect to have multiple documents good for that purpose. The document will discuss oil pre oil uh, price change. There's a lot of documents that talk about oil price change, right? So there's like maybe 100,000 documents on the web that talk about that, maybe more. What would be a query that has only one, or maybe two, but very few relevant things? One more document? Hmm? Only one document, the full text of the document? The query contains the full text of a document? Yeah, yeah that's true, but, but that's unrealistic. I mean, who, who does that? A sort of navigational query, a URL that says, I want to get to that page, right? So, uh, when do you want to go to a specific page? You just type facebook.com, but that's the same as typing the URL, right? You can just type dub, 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 dash, dash, colon, colon, whatever, facebook.com, and you get there. That's not really a navigational query. You're not asking the search engine to find it for you. Probably the auto-completion comes and you just hit enter and you've got Facebook anyway. So you're not, you're not really asking Google to produce a search for you. Um, maybe if you want to see like a restaurant menu for a specific restaurant. Right. So there's probably only one page. We're not talking about the serving content. Uh, he's right. That's one page. Now, that page is probably stored and restored and backed up on 100 servers on Akamai. We're not talking about that. We're talking about as far as the URL goes, it's a fixed URL, the menu of that restaurant he wants to go to, right? And, and, and unless somebody download the menu and put it on their website somehow, it's that page only that can serve the purpose. A Wikipedia article would be like that, right? I remember I've seen a Wikipedia article about I don't know, I give an example, Napoleon, a few, few, few weeks ago, right? I knew that article because I've read it before in my life, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know it's somewhere in Wikipedia that I wouldn't know the exact URL. I can't just type facebook.com and go to Napoleon. I probably type Napoleon Wikipedia or just Napoleon and Google would actually do a search for me and then I click on... Wikipedia might not be the, the top result. Google with all these ads my actually not score very well in terms of RR here, reciprocal rank. But Google knows for sure that if I type Napoleon, the, the top result should be the Wikipedia article. There's no doubt about that. Just like Amazon knows when you type a certain product number, you want to get to that product. Right? So there are navigational queries that do require a search in the sense that you don't know exactly the URL, but you know you want to get to a product, to a link, to a patch for your game, to a store menu, to a something like that. And they maybe one or two, I mean a Best Buy store hours might be indicated in multiple pages, not just one, but it's still we're talking about few pages. We're not talking about a thousand results. In this case, it's really not appropriate to use average precision. Average precision is a recall based measure. So recall based. Meaning in average precision to get good numbers, you have to address the recall issue. You will see this in the homework one. Why you think your average precision number is thresholded by 0 0.2, 0 0.3, those values, right? No matter how hard you, you try, you can't beat those values. The reason is not that at the top of your list there are not good documents. Probably for every single query, top of the list have good documents. The problem is recall. You can't really get that many good documents that fast. By the time you get half of the documents, you already have a lot of false positives. And to get really all the relevant documents, you have to go to the rank 25,000 and that means how many false positives are in there, how many ends have to be in your ranking for you to get to recall, say, 80%. Right? If a query has, you look in a QRL, 
A query, a query has 180 relevant documents. By the time your BM25 or your own scoring function gets to retrieve 180 or 160 relevant documents, you get a lot of negatives in there. So the real problem with average precision is that you get, have to get good recall to improve the number. Question? Yeah, have you seen any papers where it compares something like maybe BM25 or some of these other ones that we've looked at with uh, like a regular expression uh, query? Uh, for like a title or anything like that? Right, regular expressions I, I think are good for, uh, not good for factual queries. So they, are, they have a purpose. But what would be the point of a regular expression if I ask, say, nuclear bomb, right? I think regular expression work when, when you have, here's a trivial example, when you have a beginning of a term and you know it has to do with nuclear, everything nuclear. So I'm, I'm saying, I'm asking for any biogram or any star nuclear, something like this, right? Uh, if I'm asking for a pattern in text, it makes sense to use a regular expression, I think, definitely. Uh, that's not very good for general English, but for a lot of spe special domains, especially medical domain, there's the, if you look at those medical terms, you can clearly break them up into how are they constructed. I'm more familiar with medical terms because I do work for hospitals. Uh, a lot of the words have to do with some disease, some part of the body, and then some severity, and then some stage or, or, or doctor opinion. And then you can look at the pattern and map it into many diseases, many patients, so on and so forth. But I think in English text, keyword-based queries, which is what 99.999% of web search right now is keyword-based. No, nobody types anything else than keywords, right? It's hard to find a pattern in those things. Yeah, um like for Twitter, for example, maybe you need a different ball game. Like it seems like oh, yeah. those are set up yeah. for longer tags in general, like you're saying. Right. And, and Twitter has a lot of problems with abbreviations. It's not really, it's close to regular expressions, but not really regular expressions. Getting all these abbreviations right, what they mean, it's actually becoming a big, big problem in text right now. A lot of airplane companies, medicals, Twitter, log, blogs, people, so on and so forth, use a lot of abbreviations that feels, you know, second nature to, to everybody. But not that easy for a computer system to understand what these abbreviations are. People have thought of this problem, by the way, as translation. So the way they solve translation from English to Spanish can solve abbreviations that way. It doesn't work. So that, that's kind of a machine learning uh, application to, you know, how do we solve a certain problem. NLP also have a lot of tools that are good for all kinds of things in here. Okay, so the RR is not a recall-based measure. It, it's only looking at the first relevant document. As long as you get the first relevant document, it's all that matters for this reciprocal rank. The rest of it, how much you get recall or how many documents you get, might document you get right by the rank 10 or by the rank 100 is relevant. So what does really RR measures here? So suppose I say mean RR, just like remember how I said for average precision, MAP was the average of our over queries, right? So MAP average of AP over, in your case, was 25 queries. But maybe I have more queries, so average over many queries. Mean RR, same thing. Average of RR over 25 queries. All metrics are reported over a set of queries. Makes sense to not just try one query and report the metric, but try a bunch of queries and report the metric. So what does this, if I tell you this value is 0.5, what do you infer from that? Say, I have a system, an IR system, and I run it over a bunch of queries, and my mean reciprocal rank, presumably navigational queries, again, this doesn't make sense for keyword factual based queries, but I run it for navigational type of queries, or answering type of queries. I want, I want to know, I'm asking exactly what is the address of MFA, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Obviously, I'm looking for an address. Now, the MFA address might be in 17 pages, 
But me as a user, I only care about the first page that has the MFA address, right? Once I see that MFA address, it doesn't matter how many other documents have it in them. So what is a 0 0.5 telling me? How? I mean, I've dropped my eraser. Oh, there's a collection of erasers in here. Because once you drop it, you need to break a wall to get it. <laughs> so there's like five of them. OK, no eraser like this. Very well designed, this board. I also appreciated the other day the top of the board. Yeah. Um, OK, so what's 0 0.5? What does it say? saying for every two queries on one of them I get the top result to be good and the other one not. I mean that's a possibility that will give me 0 0.5 for one query out of two the top result is the one I, I need and for the other query that doesn't appear anywhere right because you need a zero to get a zero it means you don't see that document anywhere in top a thousand. This is not a zero one thing. This is 1 over the rank. So if it's a rank 1, I get a 1. If it's a rank 2, I get a 1 by 2. If it's a rank 5, I get 1 by 5. So what, what does 0 0.5 mean? An average, you find what do we want in a second position. At an average, I look at the second position. So OK, that's not really an average, because this is a harmonic. It's an inverse. So, But in terms of my effort, if you, if you want to think about this way, my effort as a user, what's my effort to get to my answer on average? I have to read two documents. So I think that's the design of this metric, is to say, look, if you're looking for an answer, then you don't care about all the pages for that answer. Like I'm looking for a location or a phone number or the menu. Once I see it, I'm good. I, I, I don't need to see, I don't need to recall. Recall means, you need to see all the documents about that, not just the first one. Like if I type nuclear bomb, I'm not interested only in the top document. I want to see everything about nuclear bombs, right? That's a recall-based evaluation. In here, it says, on average, the effort to go to the, to get what you want or where you want, if it's a navigational query, it's about two documents to get there. So how many things you have to read. That's a quite useful measure because what do you think web search queries are? Typically when people put a query, they want to see the top result that's relevant, meaning non-recall based, that's called precision based. Precision means I care about the top of the list only. Doesn't matter to me how many good documents are being produced, just the top, I'm feeling lucky kind of thing. So this is precision based. Uh, and this AP is recall based. In here, to get a good value, I need to see many documents that talk about my query, that are good for my query. So now, what do you think the average user does when you put a typical query? How many times it's a recall based query? How many times it's a precision based query? How many times do you really ask, I want to know everything that's to know about the subject, or, or a lot of information, could be repeated. And how many times you ask him for something exact that once you see the first time, you're good. You, you don't need to move forward. Is which one? You want to see the exact position based. Right. Most, I wouldn't say it's 99. I think it's about 90. Nine out of 10 queries on the web are people looking for a specific answer. And once they see, it could be a definition of nuclear bomb. Right? I mean, it's not, that's not a recall query. If I just want to know what a nuclear bomb is, right? It's as soon as I see what it is, I'm done. It's not like I'm looking for the whole literature of nuclear bombs, who worked on them, who produced them, who have been used, uh, how big they are, how strong they are, whether the, the, all those treaties, and blah, 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 blah. I just want to know what it is. Once I see the definition, I'm done. That's still a precision-based query because I'm looking on the first result that answered my query, nothing else. Nine out of 10 queries on the web are this kind. Everybody who wants to book hotels, 
planes, right? Most of the, them are here. Uh, now, you could say when I book a flight or a hotel that I'm still going through some rank list of results, not from Google, typically from others. But now even Google has it, but there's some services that do that for you. And you look at the ones that are in your you know, time frame and you out of those you book. Even though that retrieves all the airplanes and the tickets available for you, it's still, as far as the evaluation go, a precision-based query because when you filter down to your days and your time and your destination, it comes down to two or three flights at most that you can use, or maybe four, right? It's not the kind of query that I'm typing something and I may have to go to 100 documents to figure out, or 1,000 documents to figure out what's in there. As opposed to that, informational-based queries are typically things that I want to collect all the information that I could find. I'm doing a research-based project or a literature review or a law review. Some I work for a lawyer and the lawyer asked me, you know, find everything you can about relevant cases. Or I'm typing something that I don't know what it is. I just, you know, I, 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 I find something today and I, I, I don't know what it is, I'm typing it in. Who knows what's going to come back? Maybe I can read the top document and be happy. Maybe I'm start reading a lot more about that thing. Okay, so we have reciprocal rank here. Um, so what? That there's one more metric that we need to do, and then we go into that's the core, and then we go into advanced stuff. This other metric that we need is called uh, NDCG. Uh, let's see if we remember this normalized, discounted, cumulative gain. A very fancy name. Uh, it's really not useful to think about NDCG in that term. So I'll give you a much more down to earth definition of what it is. Um, you think of a, of a rank list of results. So Microsoft came up with this, or somebody working at Microsoft came up with this and picked up really quick because it, it helped uh, understanding the value of a result against the cost of a, of a user. You know, especially for advertisements, services, this is really useful as opposed to average procedure. What I want to compute is two for each rank, right? So for each rank, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth. I want to compute um, a gain uh, called that uh, benefit. And I want to compute a cost or expense. So I have to figure out those vectors. The one is here. The first one. Two. Now, the magic of the people who designed this, it's a, a, a researcher from Norway, I think. He built his entire career on this thing, and this is cheap. Like, he made him a superstar, because Microsoft and Google start using this metric in their system, so he became very famous for this particular thing. The magic was that he led those two vectors up to the use case to define. If you are Google, you might define cost and expense and benefit differently than if you are a user, differently than if you are IBM, differently than if you are Apple, differently than if you are, you know, it's up to you to define those. NDCG, what it does is takes the gain vector and multiplies by the cost vector, the two vectors. Vectors. And of course, it may be normalizing. 
I need to know I may need to normalize this value or score to compare to to to, to go against different queries, right? Because if they're not like any normalization, if I have values that are not on the same scale, I can't really average them or sum them up across queries if, if I if I want to do that. So now, what should be? Where do we gain? Where do we get gains and expenses? Hmm? You can get gain from R whenever you want to go on your website based on that. Uh, I, I don't want to go that far. I mentioned advertisement systems, but we're still in the homework one type of data. It's AP eighty nine. We have queries. We have. A search engine that process result and you have the user who reads these results from a user standpoint when the game is high versus low what makes a rank one or two or three something valuable relevant though that's what the game is based on so game seems to be a function of relevance I get something if I read a relevant document. The more, do, the, the more relevant the document is, presumably the better the game, right? Like in your case, you have 0, 1, 2. 2 should be a high game. Like if I see a 2 document, then I'm learning a lot about my, my, my question of query, right? If I'm in a navigational sense, a, a high game should be the document that gives me the answer. I'm looking for an address of the menu. I, I just found. What should the cost be based on? What is the cost from a user perspective? The search, the, the the actual computational search, like how how much my CPU has to work to produce the results. That's more like from the system point of view. If you are Google, you have to worry if I'm answer so many queries in a second, how many computers and CPUs and RAM do I need to have? But from the user perspective, queries happen almost instantly, right? right? When you type a query, you're not really worried how much electricity Google has to spend to retrieve those results, do you? But you worry about what? What is your effective cost? How much time? Is it? Uh, my impression is that this is almost instant. For most queries, the result can instant to me. I, I, I don't think today people are worried about response time. Because in most cases, it's far more, more fast. It's faster than, than other things that you have to do. So once you have the results, now what's your cost? It's almost Right. So that's the cost of a user. Should I keep reading? Suppose I only found partial information for my query. If I stop, I've got what I've got already. I learned a few things, right? But I, I know maybe there may be more information, but there is a cost associated with that, which is I have to read more documents. I have to spend time clicking. If I'm on an internet pay service, I have to pay more money to, I don't know, right? So cost is a function of time or document rank. And there might be there also document length. Right? It's effectively how much time or effort I have to spend to get to the new document. I'm assuming here the basic version that these are in order. Like if I move to the next document, I've read document three, the next one is gonna be is document four. And if I read four, the next one's gonna be five. So that's not really true. People notice right away when two documents come from the same website, they decided that's not the website I wanna go to or, or, or something like that, then they're gonna skip a result. If they want to look for an image, they go directly to you know, images, if the search engine retrieves images. Um, if, um, if something might look irrelevant from the URL alone, you know, sometimes we skip URLs just, just sometimes by reflex because we, we know that's not the one we're looking for. So, but, but most of these uh, 
framework assumes reading documents in order. Okay, so how should we define this? I'm going to put one example of such gain function, the one that I mentioned before, but it's really up to the system to design what's the gain. So the gain that Microsoft is using is 2 to the relevance. This is the grade. So in a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 cents or 0, 1, 2 cents, uh, typically the gain is exponential in the grade. Not necessarily with the exponent, ba the base being 2, but it's assumed that for most people when they rate a movie a 4, it's double or 1.8 more than if they rate a 3, which is 1.8 more than if they rate a, 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 a 2, so on and so forth. That, that's a basic version. There's more complicated versions than this. And how about a function of the document rank or time? Again, I'm going to make one up, and you can make up different ones. You know? uh, how about one over the log of the rank? I think we may have to add plus one here, because if we start at rank one, log of one will be zero and that doesn't work out in the denominator. Um, So a, a, little, a little discussion about uh, what we actually call cost, the same discussion we have when we say similarity versus distance, which one's which. Um, gain obviously depends on relevance. Like you can choose a different function here, but the gain, how much you benefit from reading a document, doesn't matter if the document is here or here or here. It's what's written in it that matters. Right, so I, I hope that's clear. Who's with me? Hands up so I can see them, please. Okay. How about the cost? Is the cost supposed to increase with ranks or decrease with ranks? Decrease or increase? Now, I, I'm not, I, I can change the name. Uh, let's not call it cost. Let's call it uh, whatever. Anything you want, pineapple. My question is, when I, when I, if, if that's what I really want to do, multiply the gain vector with this cost vector or the pineapple vector. Don't get stuck on the name cost. Let's actually figure out what we want this to produce. Right? Should it be, let's assume the first value is one because I can, I can normalize it by multiplying everything with something. Let's assume this is one. Is this supposed to be bigger than one or smaller than one? This is actually decreasing this function, right? This function here, at some rate, it's a logarithmic rate, as the rank increases, this decreases. So this, this function I put here at rank one will give me what? Let's assume it's log base two. Rank one plus one is two. Log of two is one, that's one. That's the one. What happens at when rank is, say, three? I get a, I get one over two. So do I want to increase? Again, I say cost. Let, let's ignore the for the moment the fact that I say cost. My, my real question is: Should this vector increase or decrease? Do we want as we go down the ranks? Do we want in a product fashion. So remember, I'm going to multiply with this. I'm not going to divide with it in the multiply way. Should I increase those values? Well, rank one is it's a, it's a matter of um, convention. How much do you think the cost is rank one? Let's assume it's one 
as a reference point, rank one. That's the document everybody's going to read, right? Because if you put a query, you're going to read the first result. Right? What about rank two? Should it be count more than rank one, less than rank one? Again, the gain function cannot be determined by the ranks. The gain is what's written in that document, right? We have no control by ranks over that. That, that depends on how useful is the document. But as far as the rank goes, should this count more or less than one? Now, I think you are a search engine, right? I'm Google now. And I want to measure the quality of my search results. If I put one point in the first rank, in the second rank, should I put more than one point or less than one? Why more? Uh, here's why, okay, so I'm stopping now because, again, I'm way more advanced than you guys are. So it doesn't help me or this class at all moving lightning fast and discuss things that are way way, way away from your home. But this is the actual critical point of NDCG. The point of this Nati formula is logarithm or exponential or whatever. That everybody can design what's the gain. And if you have a manufacturing process or an insurance company, you may want a very different gain function than, than Microsoft has for their search engine. The question is, if you want to organize your evaluation in this way, and you have a rank sort of rank list, whether you have ranking books or products or, or I don't know, you are stop and shop and you, you want to, I don't know, figure out what items you put in a, in, a, in a first row so people can see them better, right? Or what kind of trucks to use to deliver packages and which way you deliver first, anything like that that has a rank list. If you're designing a, an evaluation that is two vectors, one that's purely a content function, that's the value of the package, and two, the other vector is the positioning of this package in your rankings, because this we say the cost has to depend on where in the ranking is this item. And the, the gain has to do the value. You can think of courses, okay? Here's another example, courses. If I am to rank courses that you might take as a master student, the gain will be the value of the course. What's in the course? You know, how much do I learn? How much quicker do I get a job? Whatever. The cost has to do with the order. At what point you take that course, how much more valuable it becomes before taking other courses or after taking other courses. So that's, I think, the way we have to think. I think I mislead you guys with the name cost early on. I'm saying, let's ignore the name cost. Should we want to decrease or increase this thing? I mean, the question is obvious. If you are Google, you're going to put more money on the first result. Because the first result is what everybody sees. It's what everybody's going to read. It's what most people would buy because it's the first item in the store. Did you ever have that sensation? You enter the store, you pick the first thing, and later on when you got to the back of the store or at the cashing machine, you're like, huh, or you got home maybe. Uh, that, that was not the right thing to buy, but I bought it because it was right in front of me. Nobody felt like that in Stop and Show? <laughs> Nobody felt like that. Did you bought the first thing just because it was in front of you? Or you watch a TV show just because it was the first TV show that pop up? Or, I don't know. Uh, no. I'm not convincing at all. What? We usually just get for, uh, the first things because they're like, I want to explore more before uh, you know, getting, picking up anything. No, I understand that makes sense, but it, 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 as logic goes, I, you know, good for you that you do that, but it's really what actually happens. Suppose you rush up, right? And you go to a store or you rent a movie or, I don't know, take a class 
or you will rush up on that. Or, 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 you know, sometimes don't you make a decision because it's in front of you and you don't want to, you know. And, and make no mistake, a lot of commercial services like Stop and Shop will put in the front the items that they would rather have people buy, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you notice that certain products don't, don't do much advertising and don't need much advertising because everybody's using them. I mean, they do some, but there's a lot of ads for products that are not being sold well, sold well so, so then, then you know, they need more advertising. Anyway, uh, so this function here, I don't know if I convinced you guys, but in IR, the top result will be seen by most people, used by more people, sell more ads, feeling lucky, clicked more, all of that. So that's going to get more points. But that's not essential. So I, I, I don't want to get stuck at all into the actual decrease function here. Uh, I want you to see how can I apply this thing if I'm to apply this kind of evaluation for, say, um, Apartments I can rent, or or uh, places I can go in vacation, or maybe things that I want to buy. Everything that 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 has a natural rank list in it. So there's clearly one, two, three, four things. Uh, how can what would be the cost vector and what to, or, or the ranking vector? Let's say it's cost ranking. And what would be the gain vector? Gain is a really tricky thing. Rank, um, the, this is typically can be estimated quite well if a lot of people go through that ranking process or a lot of queries go to the ranking process or documents. But gain is really domain specific. To answer the question, how much more useful is this particular document for a lawyer or for a doctor? You gotta get into that domain to answer. Okay, a document that's that's evaluated this way really has an exponential two to the r value. Microsoft came up with an exponential value by looking at a lot of ratings and judging by user studies how people react to the grades. It typically assume now that a lot of this item rating, like I said, Netflix, Amazon products, so on and so forth, have a exponential uh, value in them in terms of gain. How much do you gain by watching a five-star movie versus a four-star movie? Um, this works really well with graded relevance judgment. So I should mention here at average precision. This is a very popular metric information retrieval. This is around for 40 years everybody's using it. But it uses a binary so um, when we say precision, this implies binary rates. Right? When you talk about true positives, it's a binary world here. It's either there or not there. There's no gradation. But, but this gain function can easily take grades in it. Right? I can easily map grades into some sort of gain. Exponential, linear, or some other function. Also, the cost can be so we wanted to do something that uh, we don't want to give you two homework fives or we don't want to ask you to judge the documents twice in a binary fashion and then graded fashion but we want to be able to implement both metrics so if I go to the binary world, that's was homework one and two. A lot of the evaluation homework one and two is binary. If you look at the curial file, it's zero and one. Every single document is marked as zero and one. So that's good for average precision, and that's a traditional or classical way to evaluate things. Everything was marked as a yes or no. But because in the last 15 years, everything has moved towards gradation and five stars ratings, I feel it's much more practical to understand annotations and judgments in terms of grades. In fact, every time you do a survey or, or you rate a movie, you're not going to be in a binary world anymore. So you'd use something like NDCG or other metrics to do so. So we ask you to do 0, 1, 2, 
zero one two three four would be too much of a headache because uh, you would have to define internally what's the difference between rate which is typically very high. You still have to do a little bit of that because you have to create a separation between one and two, right? When you say something is definitely relevant, that's a two, versus when it's marginally relevant or related, that's a one. But that's the kind of thing that you have to do when you rate a movie three or four, right? You have to decide what's in three and what's in three. So it would be easier to do binary, if that's your question, but then we wouldn't be able to implement NDCG, which is much more realistic in terms of if you go to an industry job related to evaluation, very likely it won't be based on average precision. Okay. Uh, and then we have to decide on the implementation. I won't spend much time on that because the tricky value is very simple. How would I implement NDCG? How would I implement average precision? How would you do this? NDCG, I think, is pretty easy. You go through the rank list, you compute the two vectors, and then you, you, you multiply them. You may have to normalize somehow. We'll see that in some slides I have. Uh, where is the discounted? What, what that means? So I think everybody can see gain is the gain. How much do I get total? Cumulative gain is I'm summing this up. Uh, uh, dot vectorial product is product by components and then summed up, right? So the sum addresses the cumulative, right? The gain is value. Cumulative is total value by going through the list. Normalize it. I want to put things on the same scale somehow, so we discuss that at the end. You know, normalize so that the highest possible result is one, for example. So everything becomes a row one. That's a technical thing. But what does counted mean? That's the same question I asked before, by the way, with how those values should work here. But I, I say the word cost too early in this lecture, and then I throw everyone off. <laughs> so what does discounted mean? Mm. I'm not sure. Does it mean if you're like prioritizing the first results, or you're prioritizing later results, like what's more important to you? Like? Right, like it's a diminishing return sort of thing, right? Yeah. Is it how much I can, if I get one point, the reference point for the first one, well, the second one, it's only really 0 0.8 discounted because it's the second one, it's not the first. Then the third one is a half, discounted even further. If you look at this function, it's not a linear discount, right? It's, it's a, after a while, they get very, very close, those values. The, the, the way it's diminishing, it's actually by very little. Once you get to the rank 100 or so, what's the difference between log of 100 and log of 101? That's almost nothing. So the discounting happens a lot at the top, but it kind of flattens out at the bottom, right? We can plot this function. This is the rank, and this is one over log of rank plus one. Where rank is one, I get a one, right? Right here. What's gonna happen from here? When rank is, we say three, we get a half, right? So this is going to go like this. There's a discount function. I really prefer to think of this as a, as a total benefit by take, multiplying two vectors that are relatively independent, conceptually speaking. One has to do with the value in each document. Totally independent of ranking. Those documents were written before, nothing to do with the ranking. And one has to do with the ranking, not to the value of the document. So I'm creating those two vectors and making the total between them. That's my total cost-benefit measure. That's how I think about this. But if you like the discounted version, you can think about it that way. This is how I get for the first rank, and then how much discounted is the second rank, third rank, fourth rank, fifth rank. This guy who invented this is a Norwegian name that I cannot pronounce, but I, I, I'll show it to you hit absolute gold with this thing, which has nothing uh, fancy in it. If you look at whether it's a dog product and this stuff makes sense, it turns out a lot of things can be evaluated this way, measured this way, right? Um, 
Everything that has to do with ranking that can implement it directly here can be evaluated in this way, with the condition that the discount or cost function should be co constant for everything. So what, what WebSearch does uses a function like this for every single query. Or sometimes they do query categories. If it's uh, maybe navigational queries, I use a different discount. But I have to figure out then, is it a navigational query or not? I have to know that. What would make sense, by the way, if I have a navigational query? Should I use a steeper discount or a more relaxed discount? A relaxed discount is one that actually doesn't decrease so much, right? Let's, let's say here, relax discount. It would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, at some point 0 0.99, 0 0.99, uh, at some point 0 0.98. It's a very, very slow discount. It actually counts mostly everything as once. What's a very aggressive discount? Discount. What would be a very aggressive discount here? Say 1, we have a reference point in the first one. The second one is, say, a half. The third one is 1 8. Then it's 1 16. I don't know, 1 over 32. By the time I get here, it's like 1 over 2 to the 20 or something. Something that decreases very, very fast, like, say, a geometric progression or something like that. So that aggressive discount says, if you didn't return the first result to be good, you lost half of points. And if you didn't return it here, you're already almost out, right? So um, okay, let me ask a different question. Maybe I, I really want to implant in your mind how this discount should work. But from a practical perspective, I'm not interested in mathematical functions here. But how should you discount things? to make it appropriate for the event you want to measure. Did you ever win a medal of some kind? Prize? Something that's not ordinary, like you take a course, you get a grade, everybody does that. But did you do something else and you got some certificate or award or medal? Did we? Right? So you went home, if you were a kid, and the first thing you did, you show it to your parents. Mom, I got this medal, right? If you're not a kid, you're a teenager, you would show it to you know, other kids in the class and say, see, I got this medal, right? The fame or, or praise or, I don't know, cookies you get for that medal is different. It depends on the medal, right? right? So, uh, I don't know if you ever contacted anybody like you know I, I was in a, in a room where a kid gets an international award something like a gold medal at the you know International Olympiad of Mathematics right? the moment that kid came back home and came to the first day of class the whole high school was was a celebration nobody took any class because the kid in my high school went to the International Math Olympiad that's a huge event and got the gold medal so everybody was like stunned about this performance. That's a huge thing, right? The value return for such a thing is in enormous. And later on, maybe, you know, Princeton accepts you to be a college in the, in the, in the thing, right? So how a discount works, up, not measuring cost and benefits, but what would the discount be for the Olympics? I'm running Olympics, right? And people get uh, medals, right? So, in terms of fame, how would the discount work? How, would they give what? Gold? Silver, bronze, three medals, right? And then nothing? Is that true? That's how most Olympic, yeah, right. So, what the discount effectively is for the Olympics here? I'm not, I'm not using the NDCG framework. I'm just saying, if you are an Olympian, and you come back home after the Olympics and you want to show off with what you've done. The show of value, what is at the top? Top is one, right? We say reference point. Well, how much more show or less show off you do if you get a bronze medal? 
So what is it? Silver is the second one? Silver. All right. So is it half? You don't think gold shines more than double the silver? So I said, oh, I got gold at, I don't know, snowboarding, right? Suppose, you, you, suppose you're on a mountain and you do snowboarding, and the guy says, I got gold at snowboarding. Wouldn't you stop and look at that guy how he snowboards? More than if you stop for the silver guy? I don't know, I'm just asking. I think gold at the Olympics, so I think it's a huge event, gold in there is something that sticks with you the entire life. You'll be remembered for taking the gold at the Olympiad more than anything, right? So the silver is really, it's a show off, but it's not, I don't think it's half. I'd say, I don't know, one third? One, 0 0.4 maybe? How about the bronze? Is it really much different between silver and bronze? Mm -hmm. yeah. You didn't go to the Olympics, right? We, we, we regular people, we didn't go, right? But you watched the Olympics last winter? You would remember who got gold if you care about something. So I went snowboarding. I found it extremely spectacular. I remember who got gold. But I don't remember who got silver and bronze, to be honest with you. I have no clue. How about in the World Cup? Do you guys watch soccer? Who won it? Yes. Who was the second one? Who's the third one? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Everybody knows the answers, right? So, but you get my point. I think this is like 0 0.3 in here. Maybe I got this wrong. Maybe, maybe you can define this. Certainly, we don't remember any anybody else, right? If you if you go to Olympics and you get a medal, I mean, who's going to remember you? Just your family, right? Nobody's going to remember anybody who didn't get a medal, right? So I think you gotta look at this in, in that sense. If you are an evaluator and your job, and now I'm serious, your job might be to work for a company and evaluate things. Of course you have to do it with a computer. How do you design this schema of discount, of ranking? It has to be really for ranking. If you're not doing ranking, this not a supply, but for a ranking schema, it has to really penalize properly in order to satisfy Whatever, customer or, or advertising, yeah. If you're going to write a function for the metal thing, would that just be like a set function? Yes, yeah, because it's a very discreet. It's either gold, silver, bronze, or nothing. Yeah. But some things are not that discreet, right? Like think about cars models. There's many cars models. It becomes almost close to a continuous function. OK. So let me show you some slides about this and other things that have to do with evaluation. This is the core things, that's what you need. Of course, you're going to need implementation before I, maybe I take a break after this. Um, how, this is easy to implement, but how about this? How do you implement double superstition? If I'm asking you, right, Drake Eval, uh, what did we say? We need a rank list of results, and we're going to need the relevance values say binary, zero, one. That's what QRL is for. How do I compute average precision? Pseudo code. What do I do? That's what Trey Kival does. Right? So how do I implement this average by relevant ranks of precision at K? Let's say I run a for loop, for K equal one, that's a rank, to and right. Uh, let me write it down. It's four k equal one to the n. What is precision? Uh, first of all, I want to compute number of relevance by this rank, right? So I'm saying um, cumulative relevance is cumulative, that's how many documents are relevant up to this rank. Is relevance, how many I had before, plus the relevance at rank K. Right? So I have a cumulative relevant that sums up how many documents are relevant so far. If this is R, 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 cumulative relevance so far is three. 
and when I'm, I'm, I'm adding another rank, I'm increasing k, I'm looking at this document and I'm saying, what is the relevance of this guy? I'm adding to my cumulative relevance. If it's zero, I'm going to stick with three. If it's one, I'm going to add one more and make, make it four. What is the precision at this rank now? Is the cumulative relevance, how many documents are relevant, divided by? No, that's recall. Precision is how many relevance I've seen so far divided by I've seen so far, which is K. And now remember I have to average only relevant ranks. How do I do that? I'm going to say if relevant at this rank is 1, meaning it's relevant, right? I have to sum my sum precision. I increase the sum precision, the numerator in here. I increase it with what? What am I supposed to average? It's not k. And I'm increasing the number of relevance I've seen. I need to know how many things I've seen. Actually, I have it already in this cumulative relevance. So I don't need to increase that. And then at the very end, what is my average precision? Is this some precision? Divide by R. Is that correct? Remember what I told you, common mistake? It's exactly this. That's how you get average precision wrong. By saying, I've seen three relevant documents. I'm counting precisions. I sum them up and I divide by three at the end, right? No, because there might be 20 other relevant documents that I have just now seen in my list. I need to divide with 20. Where do I get this 20? I have to read the curator file to see if there's more relevant documents. So this is not correct. Let's not do R plus plus in here. This is still correct cumulative relevance I've seen so far. That's going to dictate the precision of rank A. But in here, I'm going to give this R, and I need to get R, number of relevance from curial file. Somehow, pass that curial file, count how many ones are in there. For that query, that's for a query. And then I have to initialize this thing with zero. Cumulative relevance is zero, and uh, what else? Some precision is zero. There's one more thing that's a track eval specification produced by track, the conference track, which says. In the format you produce results in homework one. Remember the format of the result? Was it what? Query ID? Rank? What else? Score, the language model was the language model score. What else? Document ID, explanation, da da da. The specification of evaluation is to not go by the ranks. The specification evaluation, I don't know why, it's a convention. Do we ignore the ranks. We go instead by what? Hmm? No, no, we have one query, there's only one query. So, Trek Eval does something. It, it doesn't go by the ranks as you specify them one, two, three, four. It goes by what? By the score. Trek Eval actually supports to sort the documents by the score and evaluate as rank one the document with the highest score. So if you shuffle those documents when you produce them for homework one, put them not in the order of the scores. I'm sure you put them rank one, the highest score, rank two, the second highest score, so on and so forth. Suppose you put them in random order. You still should get the same evaluation because the order at which it processes the ranks are not the order you put them in the list. It's in the order of the scores. So in here, we're going to say 
in order of scores. If you want to replicate Drake eval exact functionality, you have to sort the documents by score just in case somebody puts the scores correctly but in a different rank order. Uh, it seems silly because you can, I think it made more sense to have specification, put the documents in the rank, in the order you want them evaluated, but the specification is to sort by the scores. So how about I take a quick break here and then we talk about sections, right? You've been put in my section or you want me to be in my section? Because everybody knows about these exams by now. You know what I'm asking? For the first time, I'm getting a, que a question for students which are not even here. They got accepted. They're going to come. And I get the question of, when do you teach algorithms? I heard the exams are very difficult. How should I prepare for your algorithms class? I'm saying, that's not going to happen until you know, January, and there'll be four or five sections of algorithms. I, I think there must be, you guys have some sort of system to track what's going on, right? It's not a formal by Northeastern, but it's not just word of mouth. There must be some websites or some forums where it's being discussed every single course who does it, nothing like that. Well, oh, that's just a general rating, right? Uh, I'll be surprised if my algorithm homeworks, for example, by now are not online with solutions. Because, I mean, so many people take them. There's got to be a way to find them. Like, I am not changing the homeworks that much. And I'm not changing them because it doesn't matter. The exams is what really matters. But it's really funny that students ask, I never had this case yet. I have now two emails that I get accepted. They get accepted, but they're still in India, probably. I mean, no, no, no. When they come here, it's normal when you come in September or something, you start asking, how should I do this and that? But for somebody to ask from now, before even coming in, before finding an apartment to stay, before that, Right now, for the spring? Yeah. No. no. Not for the spring. Not for the, the spring, no, for the fall. But, but they asked me specifically for the spring. Yeah, but they have to decide whether they want to take up when it comes to the fall or postpone it to the Seems to me went too far. Like, I don't know. I never, I never had this issue in my life, not even before going to a school or to a place, start worrying about what's going to happen there six months from now. Most people will just go and see how it is, right? No, the thing is they have to just offer two courses in the first fall. And I'll just so offer in so the fall too. So usually everyone takes that person to the first semester, so they want to make a choice to go with that or take something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Initially, there is a waiting list, crazy waiting list, but at the very end, people drop. Like, like once I teach one or two lectures, people change their mind. It's like, okay, we don't want it. That's not with algorithms. Yeah, it's all algorithms. Yeah. You, initially, the waiting list for you guys, for my section, was like more than 100 people. And then when I start teaching after two or three lectures, uh, I think there were some seats available. Not two, three weeks in the section. The truth, to be honest with you, is if I would be a normal CS student, like I'm coming to study CS and get a job in computer science, 
typically as a developer, not as a theoretician. I wouldn't take my session, I think it's way too hard. <laughs> Yeah, like you learn more algorithms perhaps, like how to think about it, but it doesn't really help you more getting, a, I struggled with that problem for years now, how do I improve that course the algorithms for the purpose not of studying algorithms, but for improving people's performance at interviews and solving problems. Right? The truth is, a lot of jobs don't require analytical skills that high, you know, and I mean, grades can hurt you in my section much more than in other sections, and then, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in, for data science students, uh, the problems class was like, uh, the one which I learned was not very really, uh, useful as per... Uh, which, you take mine, or who? No, 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 I took uh, Raj's mine. I think it's useful for general thinking ability and computer science in general. I'm not talking about a particular teacher, but in you know, order to get your goals, get the job, finish the master, and get the job that you want, some jobs clearly require algorithms, but some of them do not, right? So a lot of these, these jobs of, say, data analysis or mapping data, like what these medical people do, I, I, I do a lot of consulting for them. I don't think you need to be very good. The hardest jobs for this company is not at all algorithmic wise. They hire us to solve the algorithms problem, and we we essentially like I think they pay on gas more than they pay us. Right? Like I, I don't think we a big expense. They hired me and another guy to deal with all algorithmic problems, and they done. The real problem for them is how to manage the infrastructure. All the data coming from hospital, going to Amazon servers, moving back. If any leaks, in anything leaks, they go to jail. You know? So how do you process all this stuff? How do you measure and justify things if insurance company sues them? They have to be very defensible, their, their decision making and all that. So what I'm saying is I think I think algorithms are necessary at some point in the pipeline, but for a lot of companies and a lot of jobs, I don't think it's the critical point. So let's go back to the argument of skipping homework five and doing six seven and eight. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But, but but I do think algorithms taking with somebody who, who who can explain well has a purpose not for getting the typical job, but the purpose of you understanding something, you know, theoretical. Suppose later on you wanna do research or you want to study more complexity you know, or any other mathematical theories, then a course like algorithm really helps. Even machine learning, if you go beyond calling packages and seeing the results and the development and implementation plan, suppose you want to change a machine learning algorithm, then I think you need algorithms. So I, there was a discussion <coughs> in the college about the algorithms being the prerequisite for all these data classes. And I think it doesn't have to be for the basic version of data mining or, or machine learning. I think even you guys raised the issue that the prerequisites cause a problem for a lot of students. But once you want to do something beyond the minimum, call a library, see the evaluation, see the result, you need to think in an algorithm, uh, you know, sense. I think advanced linear algebra and probability theory is more important. I think those are tools that uh, once you know what you want to do, the plan, once you have the plan, you can rely uh, on those tools that are probably already implemented. So I don't, I think that comes as a more like execution part. Algorithms help the design. So suppose I have, I have a neural network that doesn't run the way I want. I have to change it. I need algorithm design. Now, once I change it, I have to implement those changes. I may require linear algebra. I don't know if, if you're gonna run so often into a linear algebra problem that's not already solved, like MATLAB or some other package will already do it. If you do run into a problem that's not solved, it probably, today, you need a PhD in mathematics to solve it. Like, I think it's very unlikely that to run into a linear algebra problem, MATLAB doesn't solve it, nobody solved it. You're gonna solve it, that problem. You probably need to be at the PhD in math level to do it, right? So it's, it's, uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a mathematician. I've done my, my, my college and master's in mathematics. And in my country, it's much more serious than here. When you study math, they kill you with math. 
and I wouldn't take, now I'm a computer scientist, I work for that, I would take on design on an algorithm. If I, if I say, okay, I've run linear regression with regularization, it doesn't work for my problem. I would take on how do I change it to make it work. That's all my PhD students group, the people you met, they do that. But if we run into a math problem, we need to get the inverse of a matrix, or we need to do something we don't know how to do, and MATLAB doesn't know how to do, and nobody else knows how to do, we're probably gonna call a guy in mathematics and say, can you solve this problem for us, or we give up? It's just too hard, I think, to solve those problems if you're not a mathematician. But I do think it's useful to know the basic linear algebra. You know, I mean, so the, the people who have a problem are the people who don't understand eigenvectors, and they need eigenvectors every day. That's a problem. I was, I was going through algorithms and I was I just kept asking myself, maybe it was the section that I did, it was it was pretty list heavy, but it was there was a lot of recursion. It's like In what uh, you're going through the book or Well it's going through the class and we're just doing a ton of recursion. So fifty eight hundred. Yeah. You you taking a class right now? I already took it. Okay. Yeah, the recursions are the the solving re recursive functions could be tricky. They require for a lot of time analysis. Yeah, which is was fine. It's just kept wondering why we were doing so much recursion instead of because normally I'm like kind of told that I should not do that. I think the dynamic programming was start off. Right. I I personally don't think recursions are critical for a master student. I think you have to understand where they're coming from and why it's important to solve them. But again, the actual solving them. It's a mathematical tool that some of them are complicated to solve, realize, I, I think it's just the kind of thing that you say, if I can develop the recursion and let some mathematician solve it, that's better. I do think dynamic programming, it's an essential thing that you have to understand, but that's undergraduate material. In my opinion, if you finish the college with a computer scientist, you gotta know dynamic programming. Because so many things today are effectively required dynamic programming to do. Anyway, okay, so let's go to some slides here and let's see new things and old things. I have several sets of slides, so some of them will go very fast, some of them will go slow. Evaluation. So that that's good, very fast. That's what we've done already. Relevance, precision, recall. We talk about those things, right? Uh, one thing that I want to bring up before we that's going to be mentioned later on. When I do evaluating a search engine, like in homework one, I don't want to do it for one query, right? It's meaningless to evaluate. I mean, I can evaluate one query, but most of the time to evaluate a number like mean average precision or MDCG to characterize a system by a number, I need to evaluate multiple queries and average, right? Um, some people complicate things ex uh, to the extreme, to some mathematical models. I'll show you not in this, but some papers. Uh, to the point where people who really work in IR evaluation, even at companies, were like, okay, this is way too complicated to be put in practice. We talk about true positive, false positive, uh, false negative, and true negatives. You should know the name, we can say this, confusion matrix sometimes. It can be more than three by three. The confusion matrix can be implemented as in red, blue, green, truth, predicted red, blue, green, and now I have nine cells of what was it predicted versus what was it uh, correct. So obviously you want this diagonal to be high, 
true positive and true negatives, and the errors, false positives and false negatives, to be low to get high performance. Recall exactly what we talked about precision, what we talked about precision versus recall. Um, so, in here, precision on list A at top is much, it's higher than list B, but recall of B is higher because it produces more documents, right? What I really should, you, you should uh, keep in mind beyond the math and the exact formulas here is when is the recall important? Precision is always important, right? Nobody wants to read a list that has at the top of the list junk, obviously. But what the discussion was here before the break was what are the queries that are recall based that you're not happy with the first result only. You need to see more than the first result. You want to see all the books that are written about Napoleon. It's not enough to see the first book, it's probably like 300 books written about Napoleon. You want to see all of them, right? So that's a recall based query. You want to know what are all the major achievements of each president of the United States. Again, that's a recall based query because you're asking for several pieces of information, even though the first result might be Roosevelt, President Roosevelt winning World War II, that's the biggest achievement, still that's not enough. You need to go through all the presidents and their achievements, right? Versus more navigational queries that are definitely not recall oriented. A particular piece of information might be mentioned in 25 or 200 websites, but once you see it once, that's the one. You're looking for an address or a phone number, you don't need to see it again. That's a, definitely a precision oriented query. So here's great. Um, I, I told you people have tried hard to come up with a universal schema. It doesn't really work. You could say this is correct. You know, try this in your team. Sounds good, right? Uh, zero, no relevant. One, somewhat relevant. Two, relevant. And uh, three, highly relevant. So, sounds decent. But then compare your judgments with your teammates to see how much everyone understood from this schema and how much different the judgments are. It doesn't really work because people have, I mean, you can write it in English like it's done here. The problem is what is somewhat relevant? It's still down to the assessor or the judge to say what is somewhat relevant. It's not, okay, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a well-defined thing, somewhat relevant. Suppose I tell you, Every word, every document that mentioned the word nuclear is somewhat relevant. That's a definition. Because I tell you what somewhat relevant means. If you see the word nuclear, it's somewhat relevant. This one doesn't say, it's still up to the judge or the assessor to decide, okay, you think it's relevant, I think it's not. So there could be differences. And they are. This is, nobody managed to get a consistent schema. Ambiguity, like we said, here's the precision and recall for rankings. F measure, the average between precision and recall. I can weight, uh, instead of uh, weighted equally, like we did in class, I can add the parameter beta. Observe that this beta is a uh, weights precision more, so if I change the beta, I'm weighting one versus the other. We talk about art precision, it's mostly historical that precision and rank art is that where precision and recall are the same. And more than this, you should look at the precision recall plot. Here, like this one, we, we showed this last time in class. Um, this is a parametric plot because hidden here is the rank at which is computed. You don't see the rank, but for each rank you get the recall and you get the precision and you plot that. And what happens is, as long as you don't find relevant documents in the list, you keep dropping the precision. At some point, you find the relevant document, you increase the recall by exactly one over R, and then the precision jumps, and then again drops. So what happened here is relevant, no relevant, no relevant, no relevant, no relevant, until another relevant. It dropped a few times, there's no relevant documents. Dropped again, up again, that's a relevant document. It went always one by R this way, and it jumps a little bit. And normally it goes down as the recall becomes big, there is no way to achieve a high precision when you're talking about retrieving all documents. The reason is, 
Some of the relevant documents are very hard to retrieve, so they will be at the bottom of the list. And then any system to get there will have to go through a lot of non-relevant documents to trust the precision. We talk about reciprocal rank. Reciprocal rank is much better for non-recall queries, when I, I'm only looking for the first item in the list that answered my query. I look for a location, for an address, phone number, or menu, or page, or, or something. It doesn't matter how many pages contain that result. It matters how high is the first one in my list that has it. So for a lot of web queries, I think reciprocal rank makes sense, right? Because I'm looking for some answer. It matters if it's rank 1, or 3, or 5, or 20. DSG, that's the non-normalized version. And uh, there's supposed to be an NDCG. Some other measures here, uh, based on averaging and things like probability a user of this document has more to do than just ranking, right? It's a user model here at play that says, okay, ranks are more likely to be read the first one than the second one, the third one, but People now, for example, skip everything, mostly what says on ad. You know how Google marks the ads? How many people really look at the ads? I think by default people skip the ad section, right, most people. Um, also, I think people look at the domain. They're more likely to, to click on a Wikipedia page than on other things for informational queries. What else we have? Persona K, we talk about this. Scale DCG, I don't know what this is, I think it's NDCG. Some variation. Uh, we didn't talk in class yet about NDCG. This normalized, we say the discount is the cost function, but the normalization I just put here normalized as the denominator. So how can we normalize? We, we have a score, that's a number. The reason, the, the way people do it, for NDCG in particular, is to normalize it in such a way that the best possible value you could get is one. Uh, they got that from the average precision. The average precision, we had it last time on the board, perfect retrieval, remember what it was? We say something is perfect when all the relevant documents appear at the top of the list, and once we're done, we have all the relevant documents. So now, average precision, what's the maximum value you can get? It's an average of precision values. All precision values are numbers between zero, zero and one. So the maximum average could be one, if all of them are one. The only way to get an average of one is that. Now, NDCG, it's a score that's a vectorial product here could be easily bigger than one. I mean, if I put some benefits and some cost or discounts here, when I do the multiplication, I can get 17.5, right? So how can I normalize so that the biggest possible NDCG score is one? I have to divide by the biggest possible score, right? If I divide, by the biggest, let's say call this Z. Usually normalization constants are called Z. This is the biggest possible DCG. So this value here, it's called the DCG, and it's divided by the biggest possible DCG. That's NDCG now, because I divided by the biggest possible value. I divide by max. So now, after division, what's the biggest possible value? One. But what is the biggest possible DCG? How do I get that? You're going to have to do this for home of life, right? What, what she really wants to avoid. <laughs> I'm going to have to say DCG is a product, dot product between costs and gains, right? Discounts and gains. That's up to you to put the vectors here. The biggest possible value, though, you have to figure that out. And that's theoretical. It's not related to a ranking. Right? Just look at the curl file 
and say what's the biggest possible DCG any system can have? How do I determine that? How do I determine the biggest possible value for AP? One, when it's one. No. What the search engine has to do to get an average precision of one? To put relevant, 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 relevant. What do I have to do to get the biggest possible DCG? Remember that your homework has zero, one, two, three grades. So how do you get the biggest possible DCG? What the search engine has to return to obtain the biggest possible DCG? Hmm? But in what order? There's three scales now, the zero, one, and twos. I have to get all twos first, up to all twos, right? Then I have to get the ones first. That's all one. And then zeros. Zeros don't matter. Right? So how do I get the biggest DCG? I look at the curl file. You already have the curl file because you look through the documents and you mark them zero, one, two, right? And what do you have to do? Put, put all the documents you have, two, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And now compute the DCG value. That would be by the particular discounts and, and benefits that you associate. Say you do the exponential gains and the one over log discounts. The whatever value you get here, that's the maximum DCG. That's not related to your search engine and to Elasticsearch. It's the theoretical maximum DCG value for this list. So that one, I keep as a normalization constant. And every time I get the value, I divide by that Z. So now I know the NDCG is going to be between 0 and 1. So that helps me because to average over queries, I wouldn't be able to average NDCG over a few queries if I don't do normalization. For one query, the DCG could be 17. For another one, it could be 3. And for another one, it could be 300. Those values I cannot average. But after normalization, for each query, they'll be between 0 and 1. So I can average to get the NDCG across, mean NDCG across queries, right? Uh, a lot of people have thought of this uh, in a more fancy manner. Say, instead of doing it this way with the discounts, let's create a user model. A user model is saying, what is likely the user to do after he reads this document? It can stop, it can continue, and if it continues, it may go where? So a lot of this stuff is based on a user assumption, what the user will do after reading this document. Normally, it either stops or continues to the next item in the list. So some of these models are a probability for advancing to the next document versus stopping, that is, I'm done. Uh, this is this one, rank-based precision here. It's saying the probability to read the next document is P. It's fixed in this case, say 0 0.5. And the probability of stopping is 1 minus P, which is 0 0.5. Or maybe 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. And then the probability of getting up to the rank, say, 9, can be computed easily 8 times I have to advance and 1 time I stop. Is like a multi, some, it's similar to a multinomial distribution here, yeah, but it's much simpler than that. I think this is a geometric distribution, in fact. What the model is saying to advance to rank 9 here, the probability of getting to rank 9 is 8 times I have to advance and then at rank 9 I stop. So this creates a user model in terms of what distributions of users will stop at rank 1. Stop a rank two, stop a rank three, stop a rank four. And I can use that distribution to compute a cost here or a discount function. That's another measure. Another measure, average precision, we'll talk about that. Text collection, uh, I'm gonna skip through this, but this is a much bigger deal that you could guess right now. There's uh, uh, even governments involved into this. Because uh, when search engines took you know, search engines are a major economic player now in the world. 
So the governments are concerned with all kinds of things, including privacy. That's not about privacy, but about measurements. Text and performance on text is much harder to measure than things like, uh, I don't know, economic performance. Uh, we, we already know how to measure a lot of physical measurements, length and, and you know, volumes and, and economic uh, parameters. But text is hard. Performance of text and especially how much performance like average precision relates to my satisfaction as a user. Like if the government decides to use a search engine, it's a very different business than you deciding to use Google versus Yahoo. And that's a very different business of say, a service like CNN decides to use Google. For a government, they need to go through a process of you know, understanding how results are produced and evaluating and then test them in, a, in, a, in an unbiased fashion. That's why all these conferences came along. The most famous one is in the United States, uh, TREC. This has been going on for about 30 years now, uh, starting in the 1990s, and it's a part of the Department of Commerce. The data you have in Home of One is from the TREC conference. And there's similar ones in Japan and in England and in Europe now that are specializing in producing text collections. That is the kind of AP9 collection that you've got. It's, it has good queries, good documents, and very good judgments. The curl file is very accurate. That's much harder to produce than naively you can think about. It's not as easy as you sitting down and judge a few documents and say, I got a text collection. Machine learning doesn't have this problem because a lot of the machine learning annotations are already produced. People label images or people put tags and those are the labels that I have. Uh, some of the machine learning does require annotation. So people have been at it for almost 30 years how to produce good test collections. By good test collection is if you have a search engine today and you make a change tomorrow to it, can my test collection, AP89, can you run your system on that test collection and measure the change? Right? That, that's what, what, what the main purpose of a test academic collection is to say, suppose you're building a search engine or an infrastructure. Can you measure performance today, make a change, and measure the performance again after the change, and notice the difference? Can, can this test collection, in your case, you have AP89 data or 25 queries. There are actually 50 queries in that data. Now the curl can tell you if your change was an improvement, and if yes, how. Uh, let me see. So you can see this, this track is the English, but then there's NTCIR, Clare, Phoenix, Rombic, so on and so forth. They all track style that builds test collection, includes retrieval, includes collection of documents. Some of them include crawls. I mean, one, one of those was using a one billion pages crawl for, for their uh, tracks, conference tracks. And they're very serious about it. I mean, you think it's a small business, but again, they're, they're people who dedicate their entire careers to how to measure text performance. So let me... Um, show you some of that. That's NTCIR. That's NTCIR in Japan this year. So the way usually those conferences are organized, they have tracks. So if I click on, uh, I don't know, this, that is the track um, for NTCIR 14 WWW2 track. I personally was involved in 2000, since 2007 to 2010 with TREC. My group, I was part of the group at Northeastern, together with others, that we run specific tracks, tracks that can be evaluated. Instead of running this average precisions, we were concerned about can you sample, like people do polling for votes. Instead of actually run the election, can you sample and estimate average precision with very few samples? Because you know, human effort is a big deal. You don't want to judge hundreds and hundreds of documents. So we took a statistical approach. How can you estimate those measures with very few judgments, but very directed judgments? It's not random judgments. You have to pick the proper documents to, to judge. Anyway, I'll show you that too. 
So this is an example of a task. It tells you what kind of documents they're going to do, how you submit your runs, how you evaluate, uh, all of that. They have a schedule here. What, what corpus, this may be an Asian data set. Right? So that's one track of this conference. Here's another one. Click on one at random here. What is this about? This is about evaluation um, live logging. There you go. I don't know what it is. It's, I think, people who write up what they do, right? Uh, I mean, I, I don't have a Facebook account, but I, I know my wife has, and you know, her phone it always pops up all kinds of pictures when I'm eating this at this restaurant, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm checking there, I'm traveling there. I guess that's a life work, is that true? That's what I think it means. And then how do you evaluate, how do you run uh, retrieval on this data, and how do you, it's, it's based on social networking, I think. And how do you evaluate this stuff? And, um, Here's the track conference. The current tracks for this year are center track, right? Um, I think this center track is a new thing. I think this is a how can we reproduce results? So if people have the following problem in academia, you see a paper. And you see, okay, that's an interesting idea with good results. But when you implement it, it doesn't work at all, like the way they say. So how much they, they concern with how stuff needs to be done in a way that other people can replicate and implement this stuff. Common core track, I think is the basic uh, test collection. You know, how do we perform, how do we construct collections like AP89 data and other ones? Um, and there's answering, question answering tracks. We're going to talk about question answering a little bit later. Incident that has to do with some sort of um, something happened. Right, emergency, things like, you know, there's an earthquake. How do you evaluate retrieval performance lively on an incident like that? There's a lot of stuff coming. Some of them is confusing. They're not talking about retrieving Hurricane Sunday information today, six years after the hurricane. They talk about how can you retrieve information during the hurricane. It's confusing. During a hurricane, there's a lot of information flying out. People are confused. And there's three kinds of people that matter in an emergency. The people affected by the emergency flooded your house. How do you get out? The people that are emergency systems, typically regulated by the government, you know, where should we go? What should we do? And people who want to help, but they are on the outside. They're not affected by the hurricane, you know? The hurricane is in New York. I live in Boston, but I'm willing to help. I know people in New York. I'm willing to help. Where should I go? What should I do? Um, this is a little bit of a side note, but the uh, Waffle House, the, uh, I guess FEMA was using that as like a um, determine the effect of the storm and how much assistance they need, because the Waffle House is always open. So it was just like a feature in there. Their model. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it's a, um, so there's a restaurant, and it's always open, and there's a lot of them, like, in the south, like, where, where there's a lot of tornado, like, hurricane I see. Center. And so they were using that as, like, a... But can they be affected by the hurricane? The Waffle House? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I don't know, I think in every emergency, people are eventually complaining, some people at least, that the emergency systems did not really work for them whether well, blame the government or the emergency systems and so on and so forth. So I think this is a real problem. We, I was involved in a track, the precursor of this one was called um, temporary summarization. That was a life, well, how do you deal with life events like that? Like what, what happens right now? Uh, the, qu the, the thing that I was involved in was a summarization. So you get all this information from everywhere. At what point do you create an update and what do you write in it? At what point you are sure enough that something really happened or it's correct, you have enough evidence. It's like, a, like a, think about CNN in terms of an emergency. 
they get some reports, but until they verify them, they're not really to put them on the TV, you know. Uh, isn't it similar to crowdsourcing then? Crowdsourcing uh, cannot deal with emergency situations. Crowdsourcing, it, it trades uh, reliability and, and uh, domain knowledge for size, right? So say instead of having one expert judging something, we're going to have 100 people, and we take averaging of the results, and hopefully they get the average right. But in an emergency situation, the problem is there's too much confusing information, and people need to know what to do. It's a life and death situation. You know, it's not like, OK, if I don't get my answer, I can query tomorrow. The news, I think this is uh, uh, something with just, just searching through the news articles. Precision medicine track, that, that's, a, that's a medical track. Uh, Real-time summarization was the one I was involved in a few years ago. And for each one of these tracks, if you, if you go to the you know, page, they tell you what the track is about, how do you participate. Typically, you submit, you, you get some data, you run your engine, you submit the results, they evaluate it, and they do the test collection. So I'm sure in here they tell you what, what data is and how to run it. So uh, many, many people and companies involved in those conferences. And if I want to look at past track tracks, that's all of them, sorry, since 1990s, there's a lot of spe specific evaluation runs that have been done. You can see here you have things like entities recognition, enterprise tracks, uh, crowdsourcing, how well can we do crowdsourcing and evaluate that, confusion, common core, that's, that's recent. Uh, hard track that is related to some of your AP 89 data. If you look at those queries, some of those queries are extremely hard to produce good documents for them because they're subtle, they're not keyword based. There's a meaning in the query that, that's kind of hard to get with, say, BM25 systems. So, hard track refers to queries that are really hard to find the relevant documents for. Keywords usually don't, don't produce them. Legal track or legal documents, medical track, blog track, million query track. This was a, uh, I was involved in this one. Was an attempt of judging a lot of queries by sampling so we can distribute the human effort. Instead of judging 1,000 documents for one query, judge 10 documents but for 100 queries with the same effort. Because averaging over a lot of queries may reduce the variance of the estimates in the average position. So you can see that these this track people have been, have been at work for a long time and produce a lot of evaluations and collections. Uh, sessions track is related to people who put a query and then they change the query. So a session is you put a query and change it and change it maybe one or two or three times. So the whole session has to do with after changing the query once or twice, did you get the information you were looking for? That happens a lot. If you don't get the answer the first time, most people would immediately reformulate the query. So it makes sense to evaluate the two or three queries in one step. Terabyte, that was an attempt to get a big, big track. At that point, there was 400 or 500 GB of data. But for the, that was 2004, so it was quite hard for people to index that much data. So it was a scalable, effective track. Um, so if you're looking for Re, re, information retrieval research, that's pure information retrieval, not machine learning applied to NLP applied, to, but pure information retrieval. This is the place to start. Because what they do is indexing, retrieval, evaluation, a lot of that stuff. Okay. Um, let's go to um, I want to show you here um, a good paper. This is a famous researcher from Japan, but he's very involved in all those conferences. Uh, how do I make this big? Maybe this big? So he wrote a, a little bit of a tutorial, and he has some slides for it, um, that saying, what's the state of of information retrieval measures. Uh, that was a few years ago. And I think 
this serves as a more, if you want to take it from this class and continue some work into evaluation and understand better how these metrics work and why they're necessary, this would be a good tutorial to start with. So, some introduction here. Traditional metrics. This is the picture I showed you on the, on the you know, retrieve versus relevant. And of course, out of there, it comes easy to compute precision and recall. Uh, e measure is something similar with F measure. Um, so I think it's one minus or something like that. It's, it's directly a uh, function of the F measure. Here's F measure for rank retrieval. Uh, here's NDCG, the gain divided by the log of R plus one. And what is this on the bottom here? This is the maximum DCG value that you can get. G star is like the gains sorted in optimal order. What else we have? Average precision. I didn't talk about 11 point average precision because it's antique at this point in time. Instead of averaging precision this way, what people did, they computed average precision at 0 0.1 recall. 0.2 recall, 0.3 recall, up to 100% recall. So they look at the rank list and say, uh, don't co compute that, so how many relevant doc documents I have? 100 relevant documents, right? 10%, whenever 10% happens recall, I measure precision. Whenever 20% happens, that, that's not necessarily the 20th rank, it's whatever I hit 20% of the recall, I measure again precision, and so on and so forth. And I average those 11 numbers. People have then shown that average precision is much better. I average at every relevant document, not only when recall hits 10%, 20%, so on and so forth. So ignore this, just use average precision instead. Um, so let's keep that average precision right here. That's the one we've done, right? Uh, this is written differently, but it's the same exact formula. One over i is number of relevant documents. Sums up the precision, but only for when i of r is 1. That is when you have a relevant document. So it's summing up the precision of relevant documents, divide by how many relevance there are. That's our precision. And then, some other metrics. Uh, I think this Q measure is invented by him. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. R measure we talked about uh, is the precision at rank R. That's also historical. Reciprocal rank, it's interesting. Again, it has to do with navigational queries. We talked about this. Uh, and then there's a lot of variations of how can you measure certain things. Uh, one variation is measure cost in terms of time. So instead of discounting the documents by rank, I want to discount by the document length. In other words, if I'm asking user to read a very long document, the chance of the user stopping is much higher than if I'm asking it to read a short document. So I can take the document, or even the time, I can measure how difficult the document is. And if it's a difficult document, by say the way it's presented, by the words that are there, or by the, the source of the document, I can say there's a higher probability for the user to stop. Um, expected, that's not, especially this work at rank is uh, something that associates a probability with every rank and then compute expect, an expectation value, standard expectation value. Um, RBP, I think we talked about this one. Rank bias precision has this, this is used a lot. It, it's, it uses a very simple user model that says with probability one minus P, fixed P, the user will advance to the next document and read it. With probability P, sorry, with one minus P stop, with probability P is going to advance to the next document. And because this has a nice geometric progression form, it can, I can include the gain function then at every rank. This is the probability of reaching that rank times the value that I'm getting by reading that document as the gain. So that's metrics is used now. 
uh, time-based game is the version that discounts by time and they have to approximate the time by say how long is the document, how valuable is the document, so on and so forth. Uh, and many others. You measure, it has to do with summaries. So in here, uh, people have looked a lot at measures for how to evaluate performance on a mobile phone. What's the difference if I put the search on a phone versus a computer? What's the main difference? I can still call Google from my phone, right? Say, type nuclear bomb and get results. What's the difference? It will receive your results. Hmm? It will receive your results. So the main difference between my phone and my computer is the display. It's not a keyboard, it's not a network connection, it's not a Google ability versus result, it's the display. So this measure, you measure, takes into account the display. It says, for a small display, you gotta, you got to evaluate it differently. It's still up to the search engine, like Google, to decide how to use your display. The U measure says, look, it may be better to present some sort of real summary in advance and then let the user click on what it needs to. Maybe on a computer we don't need to do that because we can present the snippets and from those snippets it's a clear indication what you need to go for. But if we display snippets, it doesn't work that well on a, on, a, on a small display. So this has been an entire discussion, especially for Asian languages that work different than English languages. How do you display things on a small display to make the most out of the queries? So there were at least three years of the Japanese version of Trek, it's called NTCIR, where they worry about, should I display a summary, should I display a list, should I let people li click on the list of things to get a summary? Um, so that's what this measure is designed for. You see, here's a table with, here's a bunch of measures at the top. And here's how, what properties they, they can have. You know, they deal with snippets, they have discriminative power, they have recall, they normalize, and you can see in this table what measures has what property. Um, normalization averaging, I'm gonna skip this, continuous matrix. Uh, BPREF is a measure comparable with, with average precision. So it has to do, I won't go to the formula, but it has to do with how many non-relevant documents do I read until I see a relevant one. In other words, how many junky stuff I have to go through to get my next relevant document. So that's the principle of it. And then there's a mathematical formula for the reading. Okay, advanced metrics. So the big, big deal in information retrieval, one of the big deals, is uh, seeing what's called diversity, IR. What that has to do is the following. People have said, okay, suppose you, you told me about the precision-based versus recall-based. And what did we say? For recall-based, we want to go through all results that are about books of Napoleon, right? Because we want to see all the books or information about, I don't know, nuclear bombs, I want to see all the documents. For precision-based queries, uh, we care about one sort of result, I'm looking for an address, and as soon as I see that address I'm done, I don't need to see more documents that just repeat the same address, right? The address I'm looking for, he was saying the menu, maybe in 25 documents, but I only care about the first one, because once I see the menu, I'm done. This is in between. This is saying, even for recall-based queries, information can be repeated a lot. So let's take examples of books of Napoleon, right? There might be 200 books of Napoleon, but each book might be mentioned in 25 web pages, or 30 web pages, right? So suppose I see the first book of Napoleon. That's great, right? Now, the next result that's relevant, meaning it's a book of Napoleon, can be of two kinds. Can be the same book I've already seen, or a new book. That's a difference, right? If I seen the same book I've already seen, I'm in the precision 
the type of query that I already see my answer, my phone number or my address, and you just give it to me again. Clearly, that has less value for a user. If I already seen that book, what's the point of seeing it again? Now, maybe it's not zero, but still it's diminishing. A new book that I haven't seen, that has a lot more value. You guys follow me? Make sense? The truth is many queries have this flavor. They're not totally precision based. That's exactly the head-on queries that I'm looking for one thing only, and as soon as I see it, I'm done. Right? They have a recall component, but even the recall, there's a lot of results that effectively repeat the same information. So just listing those results that have the same information in them as relevant, 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 they, they may be each of them relevant, it's just the same information. From a user perspective, I keep seeing the same stuff. Yeah, are there some uh, strategies for like deduplication, for example, or like close approximation, same kind of thing? Right, so the, 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 there's deduplication that deals with a verbatim or near duplicates analysis, right? I have two web pages. You know how news articles sometimes appear first and then they repeat it. the same exact news article except for the header. It's in a different newspaper and they say first appeared in like New York Times. Yeah. That's a duplicate, right? Or a citation, I say quote, I'm gonna quote now what he said. Boom, one page of what he said. Easy to find the duplication. Yeah. But what I'm talking about here is the same information that's not being copied. It's a factual thing. Suppose I'm looking for battles of World War II, right? And then I see a description of Battle of Midway. That was a famous battle when United States turned the, the, the war in the Pacific. It was really kind of edgy with the Japanese, and the Battle of Midway, United States effectively won the war in that battle. Anyway, now there might be another page about Battle of Midway which is not copied from this one. It's hard to, by duplication analysis, I'm not going to find it as a duplicate because it's written by a different author, it's written in a different language, but the information from the user standpoint is the same. Could you do like a hash function, like an enhance or something? Or I don't think so. I mean, people have tried really hard yeah. to do this semantic analysis where if it's the same information, I want the close hash values or something. I think it works when the text is similar, when a lot of the phrases, you know, are copied. Yes. But if I, if I write the battle of Midway the way I know it versus if you write the way you know it, mm, I think there will be quite a breakthrough to get the hash function that says, hey, those two things. I think you're much more likely to find similarity with BM25 to say, are those two writings more close to each other than random writings? I think that's going to come up because we're going to write about you know aircraft carriers and planes and battles in the Pacific and Japanese and Americans so all that, right? That'd be more similar than two random documents. I think you have a better chance with the retrieval function to address that similarity. So the issue from the user is. Okay, you give me two nice descriptions of Battle of Midway. Both of them are relevant, but from my point of view, if I read one of them, I don't want to read the other one because it's the same information for me. That's what diversity comes along. It's a mix of, okay, there is the novelty in terms of recall. I want to find the next piece of information that I haven't seen, so it's still recall-based. I do want to find all the pieces of information, but I, I don't want to count every single duplicate, conceptually speaking. I don't mean verbatim duplicate, I mean the same information you showed me again. So that's all this diversity. And to evaluate diversity is quite hard because you need to have a query, but also if they have sub-queries or subtopics. The subtopics are the ones that are independently relevant. Within each subtopic, we think results tend to be a little bit of duplicating each other. Like if I organize data into query and sub-queries, I'm going to say every result that's relevant for the first result I see for each sub-query counts as totally relevant. But in each sub-query or sub-topic, the more I see relevant documents, the more I discount them. So I discount them per subtopic, but not across the subtopic. So every time I see something new or topic new, that counts as a totally relevant. So of course people have put this into mathematics. 
So there's a bunch of uh, formulas here, how to do this. There are two main ideas. One is this alpha and DCG, which is a discounted version. It discounts per subtopic. Every time I see something relevant in the same subtopic, I discount it. Every time I see a new subtopic, I start from one. I say the, f the first relevant in that subtopic counts as one. And then if I see something here, if it's a new subtopic, again counts as one. But if it's the same subtopic, counts as whatever in DCG discounts. So that's alpha and DCG. The other one is similar. If you remember how I did um, uh, this page rank and other things, we have a little discussion at some point with per topic focus. We were splitting uh, uh, the world we have, the documents, with concepts, something like this. Say so these are topics of interest or concepts. In here, they are called intents. Just another name for the same whole thing. Suppose I have topics or, or classes that I care about. What is this metric does? We did this for page rank. We mentioned it on the board, I think. But nevertheless, this is saying for each query, what we're going to do is going to compute a metric. That, that metric could be NDCG, average precision, RBP, RR, whatever metric we want. But we're going to weight it. This is, a, this is an expectation here. Do you remember the expectation formula? It's the probability of seeing something times the value of seeing that something. The metric is the value. That's my average precision value for that I, for the intent. But then it's weighted by how related is the intent to my query. So if I have those intents already decided, Right? We talk about, as an example we had was business, economics, politics, so on and so forth. Somebody puts a query, I measure the, the performance with respect to each intent, but then I weight it by how related the intent is with the query. So if my query has nothing to do with intent, this is zero, so that performance doesn't count. But if the query is very related to the intent, that metric computed for that intent counts a lot. So this intent aware measure is also used by Microsoft, I think. Yes. It's more a general question. Um, it's related to, like, for example, assignment two with um, when we had the merging going on, and so we we talked a lot about the different ways to retrieve, like, you know, text and do twenty five these such of things. Um, I'm wondering about the research that's involved with like some of the more infrastructure related components, like merging the files. So like, if you do that the wrong way, it could be really slow. These types of things. You mean for evaluation purposes? No, no, not for evaluation. Just like I have, you know, a bunch of files on a bunch of different machines, and I need to merge it into the term catalog, dot catalog, term index. There's fast ways and slow ways to do that. But I'm wondering how is this relevant to this? Um, I was wondering if so. We were talking about just the way to retrieve the documents, and then I was also wondering if there was anything on the way to consolidate the documents. It's a separate, it's a more general, but separate thing. So I, I think maybe you mean where this intents come into play. Maybe that's the meaning of the question. If they're really a priori, I have to deal, my infrastructure has to deal with those intents in advance. Or are they really a runtime thing that, you know, somehow when somebody puts a query, I figure out the intents and I do something with them. That would be really costly to do a runtime to figure out all these intents, right? So I think maybe your question is, how do I deal with these intents in advance to have the infrastructure ready to do such evaluation? Yeah. So I, I think uh, the answer for that is that it's very different in industry versus academia. In academia, the answer is easy. How do we deal? Well, we specify, pre-specify those intents. If you look for diversity tracking track, you download the data, it's going to have for each query a few sub-queries. Not unlikely how you have the Dropbox. You have the main query, World War II, which really we don't think it's a query, and then you have sub-queries related to World War II. You can actually do diversity if you say, I have three, que three sub-queries. Each time I see a document relevant for that sub-query, I discount it, and each time I see a relevant document for a new sub-query, I'm counting back from one. That's easy because it's all pre-specified. Even before you start indexing, you get to see those intents, right? In real world, now you Google. 
how do you deal with this? So there's two parts, right? Discovering the intents and trends and whatever people are interested in conceptually, and then putting it that in life into an infrastructure. So Google Graph does a lot of that, right? It's a part of that does discovery and trends. So there's discovery long term. You know, it seems like certain uh, concepts are related, say all IT and operating systems and hardware and stuff like that. And then there is trends that happen something right now, like if there is an earthquake, Google has to notice that, hey, there is something that's trending today that's not the usual thing. And then how do we put that different infrastructure? I think that's particular to an implementation. I think Google uses a graph, a massive graph of entities and intents and concepts. And then they have a relation between an entity uh, action and uh, context of the action. So I happen to know how the Google Graphics organized because I know people who work for Google. I can't really say how it is, but it, there's a there's a or that was a version a few years ago. I'm not sure. There is an entity that's well defined what it is. So that has to go through a lot of NLP pipelines and so on and so forth to know exactly what this entity is. In canonicalization is necessary. I don't want to have two entities that are the same, but I don't know they are the same. I need to know that this is the same as that. There is an action. Things like, if this is a person, there's a bunch of actions that the persons can do. If this is a company, there's a bunch of actions that companies can do. I think those, initially at least, those, those actions were predefined. So they started with a long list of things and they just add to the list manually things that can happen. The context is automatically extracted from text. Once I see this entity, Virgil Pablo is a professor at Mortisa, right? I know that's an entity, and everybody who mentioned Virgil, if you write something Virgil, probably Google know, I think he's that Virgil. So they will match the entity. Wait here, professor, what are the actions you can do? Well, you can teach a class, right? You can present something online, you can go to a conference, you can da 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 So I have a list of actions of what this person can do. And the context is, every time I get a, I see this person and an action, I, I write down the snippet of the paragraph that I think is the context in which that action appeared. So it's a triplet of three things. That's a particular implementation. Um, I think there's been many attempts into how to write this down. All this semantic web and dictionaries and ontologies are effectively attempts to write down intents and concepts. But I think it works better in a specialized way. I, I'm still not sure Google Graph, for example, adds a lot of uh, benefit. Uh, in some queries, you can see how it adds benefit when it relates a person to other persons you might be looking for. But I'm not sure for advertisement purposes, for example, that, that, that it increases their revenue. I may be wrong. I, I don't know that. I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to speculate. I don't know that part at all. Now, if that answers your query or was close enough. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Uh, so intent aware, and then there's some other ones. I'm not even sure what those are. Uh, things could get complicated here. And uh, these are the kind of people who dedicate their entire career to information retrieval metrics. So this is the kind of guy, I happen to know him, that if you have a question about what measure to use for what task, he would know the list of all 200, 300 measures ever invented and which one is appropriate for a particular measurement. If you want to create a summary, oh, I don't know if that's in here, but that's important. You guys should know that. Session metrics, skip that. Uh, the ones I'm looking for is called Rouge. Everybody heard of that? This is a very popular metric for evaluating summaries which is a big deal, because in many cases, what you see is a summary produced from many documents. Summarization is a, a big application between information retrieval and NLP. How do I get information that I know already is similar? It's not a question of, I already know somehow these 25 documents talk in slightly different ways about the same thing. How do I create a one-page summary to present to someone says, this is the information you're looking for. Because most users don't look to read that much. They want a summary first to decide what to do next, right? 
Very few super specialized users, they know exactly what they're looking for. So summarization is a big deal. And uh, Rouge is the method, the, the metric that you have to know it's used for summaries. It works quite, it, it's very easy to, to figure out how it works. There is a goal summary. It's split into sentences. And that's the ground truth. Somebody already said that's the ground truth of this. That makes Rouge pretty impracticable because creating goal summaries is a daunting task. You try that. Take 25 pages about Napoleon, create a summary about Napoleon, and see how hard that is. But assuming you have the ground truth, what Rouge does, take every sentence of the ground truth and figures out if you retrieve that sentence in your summary. And if you retrieve all the sentences, it measures how much longer your summary is than it's supposed to be. So if you get a one score or a high score if you retrieve everything and you don't have much extra. By looking sentence by sentence in the goal summaries and trying to match, you usually skip ground matching. Trying to match to see, did you retrieve that sentence? Yes. Did you retrieve that one? Yes. So on and so forth. People have tried to generalize this with what called nuggets. Nuggets is an evaluation that's kind of like a concept, but it's extracted from text. A nugget is a piece of very relevant information, but is extracted from text. It's not abstract written. So then I have this nugget uh, in my goal standard. The question is, suppose I'm talking about Hurricane Sandy. There's a bunch of things that are very important, which form the nugget set, right? When it was, how it happened, what houses got affected, how big was the flood, how big was the emergency, how many people died, da 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 da. I can go through everyone's retrieval system, whether it's a page or a summary or a list of results, and say, how much of this important information about Hurricane Sandy did you get? The problem with nuggets is sometimes very difficult if they're not factual. If it says 25 people died, I can immediately recognize that a piece of text talk about 25 people died. That's easy. But what if a piece of text says 27 people died? Is that effectively retrieving the information 25 people died or is a new piece of information? So we try nugget evaluation, uh, not just our group, with Trek, to say extract the important nuggets from text, evaluate them with assessors. So that went fine. The problem was when we say, okay, the text, the nugget says 25 people die, okay? And the text says 27 people die. Is that effectively, can we check to say the text retrieved the correct piece of information? And if we say no, we're too strict. Maybe from a lot of users, 25 and 27 are close enough to represent the same effective information, especially six years later after the hurricane. But at what point the number becomes different? Okay, if 27 is, is similar enough to 25, how about 28? Is that still similar enough? How about 29? At what point we call it off? We say, hey, that's a different piece of information. It's 35, and that's not the same as 25. So we didn't know how to do that. And then, the other problem we had was extracting nuggets from text to be evaluated. We didn't know when two nuggets are the same. We knew how to match the stuff that talks about the same thing, speed of sandy, or how many people died. But when one report says 30 people died, the other one said 25 people died, the assessor, the analyst, came back to us and said, how do we know which one is correct? Like, we're reading those pages right now, right, information, with Wikipedia and other things, do we actually know how many people die in Hurricane Sandy? And we find out that the only way to know for sure is to contact the FEMA and see if they have an official count. And we didn't want to do that. We couldn't get a certified version from Wikipedia because we have conflict. For some things, we say, OK, everybody reports the same value, so it must be correct. But for some things, they were reported different pieces of information on different websites. So with the assessors, test collection creators have the difficulty of okay, which one is correct. Because we need to know which one is correct to evaluate the other systems. So, but you should know this about Rouge. Uh, I want to show you one more thing. Of course, this is a lot of research that, that can happen here. If you want to do research and information retrieval, evaluation is a very big deal. Uh, that's a core IR. 
I'm gonna say two things, one now and one next time. One now is even long time ago, uh, I'm gonna get to that one. Uh, which one is it? Is that my application? I wanna show you this in a second. This is early on, very early on. Uh, you can tell it goes to 2000. So in 2000, we're talking about Google being two years old. Like nobody was even using Google. That's very early on. Information retrieval really started around 1965 when people didn't have computers. They would start evaluating rankings and how to think of performance. So by year 2000, they already had how many measures are here? 50? By now, there's like 250 measures. You know, because by that, by that time, we didn't really have a proper search engine by year 2000. So the two things that we need to discuss that we didn't cover yet, but they're not needed for your homework. One is, the very basic reason for user study is this. How does all this stuff, average precision, NDCG, blah, 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 how does this relate to the user satisfaction? Like, can I say, if my system has a high MDCG, people are gonna use it? So a lot of user studies, evaluation user studies, are trying to relate the metric, like reciprocal rank, average precision, MDCG, to say, do really, if I tell you between Bing and Google, two systems, right? I tell you Google has a high average precision. Does that really mean that people find the information faster with Google? or better with Google, or they're happier with Google. In other words, is this measure really truly reflective of how users' per perception of the, they have of their search engine, right? I'm sure you all had queries that succeeded right away, not just that, you knew that query would succeed, right? Because if I type right now CS 6200 something, I'm gonna get the web page for the course. But you also had failures, right? You type queries and you're like, how can Google not find what I'm looking for here? So suppose I run Google versus Bing, or my search engine from today to my version tomorrow, right? And I, I measure in terms of NDCG with academic test collection, like AP89 data. And it says, okay, you got a better average precision. Your system, TFA, DF system was 0.22 versus language model was point, I don't know, 18. Is really a user that asks a query, we're going to be more, more satisfied with that search engine. There's enormous numbers of user study trying to address this question. How good are those metrics from the point of view of somebody who uses the system? 